our Father who art in heaven. Good evening to all of you who are present with us here at the Gulu Parish Hall for another consultation on electoral reform in the Commonwealth of Dominica. This evening we are at the Gulu Parish Hall to hear from the people of the West and South on the Sudanis Byron electoral reform presented to the government of Dominica on June 12, 2023 after a comprehensive review of our country's electoral processes. I would like to welcome among us this evening, Honorable Kassani Laville, Acting Prime Minister, members of Cabinet who are present with us this evening and other members of Parliament, Honorable Levi Peter, the Attorney General, Her Worship, Amin Roy, Mayor of Roseau, our observers who are joining us virtually this evening, Justice and Raphael Masaga of the Commonwealth Secretariat, Ms. Melin Glynn of the OAS, Mr. Dwight Lay of the OECS, and Mr. Gonraj of CARICOM, Dr. Kenneth Daru, Special Envoy in the Office of the Prime Minister of Responsibility for Electoral Modernization, Permanent Secretaries and other senior government officials, chairpersons and representatives of the various village councils, residents from the west coast, from the south, stretching from Salisbury to Scotts Head and um, Grand Bay and beyond, the media, those of you who are listening to us via social media, all of our other media platforms, and other invited guests. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. Okay, we have to break the ice in here. I feel it's very tense. Over the last two weeks, the public consultations have been held on electoral reform and more specifically on the recommendations of Sudanis Byron. The report conducted in two phases provides recommendations on various aspects of the electoral process in Dominica. And as we are probably aware, because I know that you've been following us for the last two weeks, Phase one of the report includes two new pieces of legislation, the Registration of Electors Act and the Registration of Electors Regulations. In phase two of the report, it is concerned with matters of access to the media, campaign financing, and other matters related to the Electoral Commission and proposes four pieces of draft legislation. The House of Assembly Elections Act, the House of Assembly Elections Regulations, the House of Assembly Election Petition Rules, and the Electoral Commission Bill. These are the four pieces of legislation recommended and drafted by Sir Byron out of this consultancy. The Attorney General, Honorable Levi Peter, will provide an overview of the Sudanese Byron Report, after which we'll open the floor for your comments your feedback and your recommendations as it relates to the report and the electoral process in Dominica. Let us welcome Honorable Levi Peter with his presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Honorable Kasani Lavil, Acting Prime Minister, Cabinet colleague, colleagues, permanent secretaries, other officials of government, members of the opposition, and indeed all present this evening, and not forgetting the observers, the representative from the OECS, Mr. Dwight Lee, Mr. Gunraj, 
representative from CARICOM, Ms. Melin Glynn, representative from the Organization of American States, and Justice Masaga, representative from the Commonwealth Secretariat. Good evening, all. As we know, Sir Dennis submitted his report earlier this year, and as he indicated, his report is in two phases. I'm going to run quickly through some of the aspects of the re report that I consider uh, of some significance. As I've said at other fora, of course, what I say is just my view. Your view may be different, and you are absolutely entitled to express that different, different view. Phase one of the report, um, Sir Dennis says, is focusing on cleansing of the voters list. And as you heard a moment ago, is supported by two pieces of proposed draft legislation. One, the Registration of Electors Act 2023, and the other is the Registration of Electors Regulations 2023. The phase one report uh, addresses a number of matters, but I suggest that parts three and five of the report contain perhaps the most significant um, elements. Those include his recommendations in respect to identification cards, his recommendations in, in respect to registration, his recommendations in respect to residency, his re recommendations in respect to uh, confirmation on the register of electors. Identification cards. Identification cards is uh, fairly straightforward, I suggest, although from the discussions that I've heard in the consultation and uh, with the consultation indicates that there may be complications that the consultation process and subsequent conversations will have to resolve. But Sir Dennis um, proposes that for the purposes of voting or use in elections that a, an identification card should be used and he has recommended that it be referred to as a national identification card. That's a clause 11 of the new Registration of Electors Act. I repeat what I've said at other fora. From a personal perspective, and I have not yet been persuaded by any of the discussions and conversations that I've heard, it probably doesn't matter so much what we call it. What I think is of significance is what its purpose is and how that purpose is achieved. So that, in other words, what information, what data is uh, inputted to that card to enable it to serve the purpose that we think is necessary. So as I've said other places, if we call it a Christmas card and it contains the relevant criteria, the re relevant uh, data, then I guess it would do the same thing as a card with any other name. In some jurisdictions, they call it voter ID. In others, they call it elector's ID. In others, they simply call it ID. But, but take your pick. In respect to information, Sir so Dennis has introduced or proposes the introduction of a compulsory requirement for a number of public officers to provide information to the regis uh, chief registration officer, or chief registering officer, sorry. Um, just um, for clarification, the chief registering officer and the chief elections officer are one and the same person. Um, they're referred to differently at different parts of both the existing law and uh, the proposed draft, but they're the same person using a different hat depending on the particular function that they are uh, uh, carrying out at the particular point in time. But Sir Dennis proposes that, among other um, officials, permanent, the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, should be required to provide um, at a particular point every year to the chief registering officer a report containing, as at the date of the report, the name of every person who is in service overseas, 
who, or who is uh, registered, a registered elector or eligible to be, and thirdly, every such person who is no longer in service overseas. So then it also proposes um, the, that the chairman of the Mental Health Review Board must, every quarter, provide information to the CRO in respect to every person who has been certified as having a mental disorder. And that is as defined under the Mental Health Act. The information that's required, would be required to be provided is the name, street address, date of birth, and occupation of every such person. The definition of mental, mental disorder under the Mental Health Act is as is, is um, mental illness or mental deficiency, however caused or manifested, and that's at section two of the Mental Health Act. You may think that that is information that is should should be be provided. Um, there are those who have expressed the view during the process of these consultations that that is uh, private medical type information that perhaps ought not to be. Um, uh, disclosed in that manner, but that's one of the factors that um, this exercise is supposed to address. Another official who is supposed to or is, would be required, um, pursuant to Sir Dennis's proposal, to provide information is the, is the Chief of Police, who would be required to provide information in respect to immigration um, transactions, uh, comings and goings of, of people. To the, um, to the chief registering officer. The third category is um, confirmation. As the name suggests, confirmation is a proposal of a process which would, would require every person who is uh, on the register of, of electors at the date at which the proposed new legislation was enacted would be required to confirm their name on the register, failing which the name would be removed or certainly would be liable to be removed um, due process having been followed. So Dennis proposes that not later than 30 days after the enactment of the proposed new register, registration of electors act that the Electoral Commission would be required to declare what he terms a confirmation period. And the recommendation is that that confirmation period should be no less than six months and no more than nine months. So a maximum period of nine months to comprise the confirmation period. And it would be that period during which anyone who is on the list and would want to uh, confirm the name on the list would have to do so. Um, and a process is uh, set out where the person would have to follow certain processes and procedures to satisfy the electoral office that they, uh, it is appropriate for them to remain on the register of electors. Final uh, element of the recommendations in respect to the phase one report and the issue of I guess cleansing the list is the issue of residency. And that is an issue which has taken on um, some significance during the course of the consultation, or I should say perhaps increased significance from the, from the discussions that I have heard both at the consultations and in other fora. Residency I, is proposed, well, currently is a, a dealt with in um, section five, I believe it is, of the existing um, Registration of Electors Act. Um, so Dennis proposes that clause 7.1c of the new Registration of Electors Act, um, the proposals in respect to residency, they are in identical terms to the existing um, provision and essentially requiring a person who wishes to be registered to have lived in the constituency that he or she wishes to be registered for, for a period, a minimum period of three months immediately preceding 
the point at which they are seeking to be registered. The other element of residency is um, in the current section 7C of the Registration of Electors Act, and it is the section which deals with the right to remain registered. Um, that's dealt with in at clause 12 of the 12, 12 um, B2 of Sir Dennis's proposed um, Act, Replacement Act, um, but that is impacted by Clause 26.1 of Sir Dennis's um, proposal, essentially dealing with the issue of being absent, from, absent from Dominica. Currently, the position is interpreted that providing a person is in Dominica at least once, even for a day or less than a day, during a period of five years immediately preceding the, uh, the poll, that he or she would be entitled to vote. So Dennis proposes uh, that that should be 90 days. That is to say a person should be required to be in Dominica for a period of 90 days, either a continuous period of 90 days or an aggregate period of 90 days across the five years. Uh, alternatively, he proposes a period of 50 days. There are those who um, contend that the 50 or 90 days that Sir Dennis proposes is good and should, would work. There are those who, who propose or um, support the view that the existing once in five years is sufficient. And then there is another school of thought which argues or contends that there should be no restriction, no limitation on a person who is registered um, having to be in Dominica for any period, whether for 90 days, 50 days, one day, or whatever. Um, that, again, is an issue which will have to be resolved during these um, discussions and consultations, but there are varying views. Um, I will listen to what has to be said. I've expressed some views at some other fora. Um, but what may be of some um, interest in so far as the, the discussion that I expect to take place tonight is that the, certainly in my view, in my opinion, the right to vote in an election in Dominica is a right which is conferred by the Constitution. Section 33, subsection 2, provides that at, at subsection 2b, that a person who is registered, that is a person whose name is on the register, is entitled to vote. The only qualification to that that I have seen in the Constitution is a disqualification. That is to say, the Constitution says, unless such a person who is registered is disqualified pursuant to a parliamentary provision, I'm paraphrasing there, that person is entitled to vote. The disqualifications provided for by way of legislation are at section six of the Registration of Electors Act, which has four subparagraphs, if you will, A, B, C, and D. And those disqualifications are person is of unsound mind, the person is serving a sentence of imprisonment of 12 months or more, the person is under a sentence of death in a Commonwealth country, and fourthly, that the um, person is, uh, it escapes me, but it's a fourth one, which I think is related to the disqualification again. So the reality is that unless the person falls within those four categories of disqualification, as I understand it, the person is entitled to vote. Um, that's an issue for debate, and it'd be interesting to hear the um, different debates that arise. Phase two of Sir Dennis's report deals with um, access to the media, which he proposes should be confined to state media. Um, there's a different view. Some people think it should be extended to private media. Again, that could be discussed. He also proposes campaign financing, and those things have been discussed at some length uh, here. Um, that's obviously an, an area of, ish, of interest. And he proposes that there should be reforms in relation to the um, constitution of the Electoral Commission. He pro proposes that the, constitution, the commission the number of uh, members should be increased 
and they should become should, should come from um, different sources than currently um, is the case. Um, the composition of the of the electoral commission, as it now stands, is determined by the constitution. The constitution currently provides that the chairman is appointed by the president in his or her own deliberate judgment, and the other four members, because it's a five-member commission, the other four members will be made up two recommended for appointment by the prime minister and two recommended to the president for appointment by the leader of the opposition. Um, therefore, you can see that um, the likelihood is that you have a um, commission that has people, and we know the people who are on, on the commission, who perform a, a function and it's the same com um, composition that we've had uh, from, um, certainly from our independence in 1978, and um, I suspect it, is, it doesn't depart significantly, if at all, from what existed under our 1967 constitution. Um, I think that's a, a potted run through the, um, what I suggest are the salient points. Um, I, I don't, maybe it might help just to say that um, in terms of the Electoral Commission, um, so Dennis is proposing that it should have greater financial autonomy, that is to say it's more control over its finances without going directly through central government. They should have more autonomy over its staffing appointments um, and a, a couple of other areas. One is that um, members of the commission, members of committees appointed by the commission, electoral staff, office staff, and so on, who have any private interest should be required to disclose that private interest um, if, if there any matter uh, is being discussed or considered by the, um, by the commission. So in a nutshell, those are some of the significant um, elements of Sir Dennis's report. Thank you. Thank you very much, A.G., for this um, summary and overview. For those of you who have been following these consultations for the last two weeks, listening or attending, I think by now you should be very familiar with the presentation of the Attorney General. Um, I do have to say at this point, um, we are going to open the floor to your comments, feedback, and um, contributions on various aspects of the report. But before we do so, I wish to say that after listening to the contributions over the last two weeks, I would like to propose that in the interest of uh, productive consultation, that we focus our contributions on the matter at hand this evening, that is the report of Sudanese Byron. Just to recap, there are some clear issues that the Attorney General has presented to us, summarized from the report, and these issues include identification of voters, should we have identification cards for voting, this was asked, there has been much discussion about whether this should be a voter ID or a national ID, we would like to hear your views on this this evening, and also what type of information should be on this card. With regard to the cleansing of the voters list from the scenarios described by the AG, should anyone be removed from the list, if so, how should this be dealt with? Should this be dealt with by re-registration or confirmation, hoping that we understand the difference between the processes? Should one be in Dominica for 50 days or 90 days during a five-year period or 10-year period to remain on the list? Or should there be no restriction at all? Should there be restrictions placed on financing of political campaigns? And how should political parties be funded? Also, the last area that the AG highlighted to us, what are your views on the expansion of the Electoral Commission? I would like to urge us, in the interest of time, since this is our largest consultation to date, I see we have quite a, a large group here, that we are brief with our interventions, and I am also urging us to be respectful of each other's views, we acknowledge that we will not all agree on the points that are being raised here today, but I do expect that we can have a productive and reasonable discussion here this evening. If you would like to speak, 
we'll, we'll get to you and we'll get to as many people as possible. If you would like to speak, please raise your hands. There are officers, um, we do have staff in the crowd with mics. For the purpose of this evening, a microphone will be taken to you at your seat um, where you will do your presentation. So I would like to see the hands. I'm going to do a list and then we'll call you in that order. Mr. Enzo Irish is on his feet. Um, so we are going to start with him. He seems to be interested in getting the batting going. Before you do, though, the Attorney General would like to make a brief comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's just, it's just I, I had indicated a fourth, which is at 6D, which I indicated had to do with disqualification, but I couldn't remember the precise terms. It reads, is under any written law disqualified for registration as an elector. And I thought that was important to complete the circle. Okay, but can we have uh, Mr. Ains of Irish? Do you have a mic? The mic. Okay, we're just checking on the mics to ensure that they are working. Okay, in yes, all right, the mic is working. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Can you hear me? Acting Prime Minister, other cabinet ministers, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I was afforded or accorded a seat where I was told that the chairpersons from the various councils should sit. So I'm the chairman of the Lubia Council, but I'm not speaking in the capacity as the chairman of the Lubia Council. I'm speaking as an independent patriotic Dominican. I just wanted to make that clear. First of all, I want to start by saying that um, I, I, I felt a bit disturbed over the last couple of days when I listened to the, the consultation. And, and even before that, and the reason for that, I was kind of saddened when I heard people who are so qualified especially in the legal fraternity, and in particular somebody right here in Dominica, a lawyer, criticizing Sir Dennis Byron so badly. A man who has done so much for the legal fraternity, a legal numerate, a man who has really, you know, done so much in the international circuit. He was asked to make some recommendations in terms of the um, reform for Dominica's election, and he submitted his recommendations, and of course, uh, some people are not happy about it. There are a few things I want to highlight, but the way in which he was savage, I found that was very unbecoming, and that I'm speaking for myself, personally. You know, I mean, we should really give this man this respect. Not only that I know Dennis, Sir Dennis Byron, but the man is a good legal person who have really contributed to the Caribbean, and we should be happy. The second thing I want to say before I go further is I listen to the major parts of the um, consultation, and I thought the former Prime Minister, Mr. Edison James, at the State House really gave some good account as to how things should go forward, and I think we should really look at those notes and, and, and make reference to it, look at it, so that we can chart the way forward. And I want to say that I'm apolitical. That is to say, I do not concern myself about direct politics. So, you know, uh, in, in this country, in Dominica, you notice, when you speak, people tend to believe that you're representing a political party, and they, they kind of either snub you or, you know, just look at you in a sense that, well, you know, you do not belong to us. The, the question of the confirmation, I do not believe that, um, you know, although I respect the report, it's a very good report, but my personal view is the question of the confirmation within 50 to 90 days. To me, that doesn't, I, I wouldn't say, I don't want to say that it doesn't make sense, but one would need more time. And in any case, I believe there should be no confirmation in the sense that uh, unless one changes the agenda, 
you know, you, you, I'm confirmed. I was confirmed in church maybe 13, when I was 13 years. I'm confirmed. I'm on the list. And I haven't changed my gender. And I do not intend to do that. So I do not believe there should be any confirmation. Period. That's my view. You're on the list. We're looking to clean the list. Of course, if people are dead, you pull them out. It's ludicrous when people say, you know. Yeah. It's, it's, to my mind, it, it sounds ludicrous. I hear people saying that um, dead people vote. I mean, that sounds so silly and stupid. How can dead people vote? One can understand there might be some impersonation. And I've been in the business. I've voted at least eight times, 40 elections. I served 40 years in the police service, and I voted every time for about eight times. And I've never seen any kind of fraudulent kind of situation where anybody come and even impersonate or try to, um, to vote not being that person. So I'm saying there must be a process in place to make sure that you pull off from the list persons who are dead. But I think our system, the system of, that we have, the operation, it has to be more fluid. It has to be more efficient. And I'll tell you why I say that. I believe, first of all, every month, the registry that gets the, the death certificates, the registered deaths, a list should be sent to the, to, to the president of Dominica and to the electoral commission on a monthly basis so that they can cleanse the list. And, and, and I'm saying that to say, my aunt, for instance, lives in the United States. He comes every July and goes back in November. Well, God rest her soul. She died. She just went back in November and in December she died, right? So I checked her list, her name on the list in, in Canefield today. But I went to the registry with the death certificate from the, 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 um, the place that did the funeral in, in the United States because they brought down the body, cremated and everything. Registry said, okay, we cannot register because you don't have, we're not sure if it's the original, we're not sure. So what is going to happen? This lady's name is going to remain on that list forever and ever. So I believe the legislation must address that by saying anybody who has good evidence or legitimate or some sort of documentation to prove that that person died, you should be able to go to the registry or to the electoral office with that death certificate. I had it in my pants pocket, but I changed my pants, so I left it to show you. So I believe these are some of the ways that we have the so well, this, the dead people, the so-called dead people or the dead people names on the list because there's not a mechanism. We need a mechanism to deal with that. And here it is, I'm coming with this certificate showing that the lady died in 10th of December in, 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 in the United States, buried here, cremated the body, brought the ashes down, buried, and they say, no, we cannot take the register. I find that is a bit silly. So that we have to work on. The question of um, removing persons from the list when they're living in the diasporic community, the so-called diasporic community, I find that doesn't make sense. Or removing persons less than five years. I believe that if a person is on the list within five years, the person can come to Dominica, whether it's one day or two days, your name should remain on the list. I can understand um, beyond seven years, because the common law, I'm sure the AG would know that he can correct me. There was a common law rule that say a law that says um, after seven years, for instance, if I hear from my brother or my sister in the United States every year, and seven years I never hear from them, it's considered that they are dead. So I do not believe we should go beyond five years. So within five years that person comes, you think, if you want to come back to Dominica after seven years or so we have heard from you, then you can probably re-register. But I believe a person should have the opportunity there are so many people around the world are fighting for their democratic rights to vote. And this is something special that we should not deny anybody from, from voting. That is my personal view. The question of the, um, the, the, the card, the election card. I do not believe. I mean, what is wrong with a national card with all the biometrics? You have, a, you have a card specifically called the, um, the election or the voting card. It doesn't give you more weight than a national card because, I mean, all it tells you is, yes, you have a voting card. But if you have a national card which captures all the information, all the, all the biometrics, I see nothing wrong with that. I mean, I just came from Germany just about maybe two months ago. And on the train, 
the, 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 um, everybody gets into the train. So there's a random check by the people who check the ticket. And when they ask you to produce your ticket, everybody pulls off their ID card also. And it's a national card. So why don't we have a national card? Last week I went to the, um, is, it, is the microphone on? Last week I went to one of these um, money changing places. I'm coming down to it, to cash some money. And then when I presented my social security, they say it expired. When I, when I presented another ID, they said it, they, they're not accepting it. So if you have a national ID card, in my view, that should be valid for at least 10 years. If you lose it before, you should make a contribution to get one again. So I believe that national ID card should be the way forward. The question of, the question of fingerprints, one more point, final point. Although I have 10 more, but I'll say for one more. Final one, final one on fingerprints. I want to talk about fingerprints. Fingerprints is a very important aspect in, uh, in governance, safety, security. And we go to the embassy and we take our fingerprints. When you go, you cannot tell the guy at this desk, I'm not taking my prints. They'll just tell you, get out. We go to the United States when we get the first thing they do, they do your fingerprint. Fingerprint is the most positive form of identification. And I'm not just saying that from the top of my head. I'm a qualified fingerprint expert, deemed in the court as an expert, trained in England, right? And no two persons have the same fingerprint. The FBI have over 500 million fingerprints, including triplets and quadruplets, and nobody have the same fingerprint. Yes, they have the same free patterns, whorls, loops, and arches, but the characteristics to make the identification, and I'm sure the age you know that, is different. And it's why is that we do fingerprints? In fact, I suggested to my Charles, the Prime Minister then, years ago, that everybody getting into the public service should be fingerprinted. It's a good database that we should have. A system called the AFIS, the Automated Fingerprint Identification System. That can help us. So I believe we should move forward with the fingerprint as we move into the apex of our development. There's science and technology. We can use it to do the identification. Thank you very much. I'll say no more. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Irish. And for, for future speakers, I'm going to give you a little signal. If I stand and come to the podium, it means it's time to wrap up. Um, we, will, we will take the gentleman who is on his feet, and then we will have Pamela Gist, and then Mr. Paul Bunch. Yeah, what you, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, you know, Madam Moderator. I must say you've been doing a fantastic job because I'll be following all the consultation. So you should tap yourself on the back. Okay, once and for all, I want to say a pleasant good evening to all of us, all those who are here, those who came from far and near, and whatever party you're affiliated to, you know, that selfie. So I want to say welcome to all of us. Most of all, particularly, I want to say a special good evening to the head table and the ad there. Most of all, you know, the acting prime minister, the health minister, welcome, sir, and to all the others. But a VIP, welcome to the observers. I, I mean, we have some from the OECS, we have the CARICOM, the OAS, and etc. So we want to welcome you all, and I hope you have a good time here, you know. We have, we have a lot of hot water. You should go over there and stuff like that and rejuvenate yourself when you go back. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, you know, yeah, yeah, we have to know, I'll be following the consultation for a long while. From day one, from Monday, and then we had the Bar Association, the lawyers, and really and truly, I'm not impressed. Because in a consultation, I mean, that shows the positive vibe so that they can take parts from there, like good points, and you could join it together with what Sir Dennis Byron, because what Sir Dennis Byron presents is not all that we're accepting. So I believe, you know, I mean, what has happened, there was just peddling, you know, the agenda of, you know, the United Workers Party. On Tuesday, there was a political party and independent candidates. And I listened to the opposition leader and clearly nothing substantial. I come on Wednesday, which are the civil engineers, contractors and other professionals. And I listened to a gentleman 
and he said that he's registered to vote in a constituency and he can register to vote in any constituency and then he can vote two places. I heard that. And I find, I mean, this is not right. You can't say because nobody can vote twice in an election from one constituency to the other. That's in highly impossible in Dominica. And the entire chiral, maybe the whole has by extension. And I listen to others, you know, parties and whatever they say. Nothing substantial, nothing at all. But, you know, it's okay, but we're listening. Now, you know, you are dealing with points, key points, which we're talking about in here, all of us here. In terms of the five-year span we have, as a matter of what is at hand at this point in time, if you have been out there for five years and you haven't been back once, you are not eligible to vote. We know that. According to Sir Dennis Byron in his report, ladies and gentlemen, he stated the same five years, but if you haven't been for 90 days, or preferably 50 days, you will not vote. And for me, trust me, I am not in favor of that. And I'll tell us why. I'll say why. I have a brother who, who is in the diaspora, brothers. In the, and we have many of them out there in the diaspora. I'll tell you that. They are working hard out there. Three jobs, four jobs. One of them, you know, the fortunate who have one job so they can probably buy a piece of land or buy an apartment, whatever house they have. So they're leaving. Some of them paying their rent. And rent in America is not easy. We know that. It's not easy for them. And they also pay their tax in Dominica. Why is Dominican here to pay in their land tax? They are paying it out there. They pay in the land tax. So they have houses. Brothers and sisters, they have houses. And they're sending them money because they have accounts in Dominica. They're building houses so that they come back here and retire. We know that. Retire. And they're paying, they're selling barrels every year. Even when bad times and good times, 2015, 2017, Hurricane Maria, they send a lot of barrels, folks. We know that. Sending monies. And as a matter of fact, my brother told us, right, at this point, you guys, he asked us, what are you these couple of shoes at home? So we take them, say, we have one and one over there. Because he came by City Breeze. He left, he, he, I mean, he, he's like, he lived a couple of days and stuff. So he left a couple of shoes. He's telling us, they've been charging for the weight now. And it's true, they're charging you now. So it's difficult. So I'm saying, brothers, even the diaspora celebrate independence, they have any Miss Warp duet in America. <laughs> they have in it, I and we come in there in Clanton side position and speaking all kind of stuff. They celebrate in St. Thomas St. Croix. They're celebrating Flag Day. We know that. We know and we come here. A lot of people come here and they're not speaking from their heart. Not genuinely. They're not doing it. They're speaking out of hate and malice. I, uh, it's true. So, I'm saying that 90 days and 50 days, it is a no, no, no. We don't want that in that. Simple as that. No. I come in. Number two, the voter ID card, which everybody talking about. Voter ID card, that is like you know the norm all over Rozo, voter ID card. But ladies and gentlemen, tell me, even though Antigua have their specific card for voting, Jamaica have it as well, and the other countries, why we should follow them? We should not. We should have a card that multi-purpose use. You could use it to vote. You can use it to go to the bank. As a matter of fact, you can use your social security card to go across whatever you could travel. And this is a government ID card, ladies and gentlemen. So why? You see what I'm saying here? 
Okay, let's suppose that you lost your ID card, which they want. If you lost your card, what are you going to do? Are you going to swear and all this kind of story? When you can just use your social security card or your passport or your driver's license because it have the picture ID on it. Ah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? I'll, I'll so be I believe the government should make provisions because according to Dennis Byron, he's saying that a national ID card is the way to go. And the government should put in place the ages right there. I'll be listening to him every night. I believe they should put in place if you lost your national ID card, whatever, they should make provision so like you, you could use something in the alternative, you could use your social security card, driver's license, or passport, if in case your national ID card, you know, be, nothing is impossible. Anything happens. So that's my second one. Uh, thank you. <laughs> we'll have to wrap up. We have a number Okay, one more, one more. I'll take one more. One more. Okay, last point. One more. But you because, have to make it very yeah, brief. Because I have all the stuff. I'll tell you what, I'm going to deal with the finance reform, campaign finance reform. Ladies and since I know myself, I never know they have campaign finance reform in Dominica. <laughs> Government has come. Government has gone. It never happened. I believe that every party should be responsible of their finance for their campaign. Yes, you should be responsible. Because, I mean, you cannot tell me, you know, I have to have an audit and how much money I use and all kind of story, and you have to pay for the audit, you know. And the, because right on my, Mr. Clarence is an audit specialist. So you know you have to pay for that audit report. So who going to pay for that? And some parties, and you see what I realize, you see what going on, what happening is 2014, 2019. And the party, United Workers Party, it seems they don't have friends. So if they don't have friends, we don't have our friends then. If you have $20, we have $20 too. It cannot be. You supposed to be responsible of your election campaign. So if you can't do that, you're ready for politics yet. So if you can't come in the jam, don't come in it. It's thank as you. simple as that. So on that note, finally, finally, I want to thank you for the opportunity. And God bless all of you. God bless Dominica. I hope we have a wonderful, wonderful night. Thank but you very much. Truth. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for your contribution. I, I would just really like to encourage us as much as possible to keep within a reasonable time limit as we indicated earlier. Um, we had we had Pamela Gist um, and then Paul Bunch. Go ahead, Miss. Good afternoon, everybody. Go ahead, okay. just speak into the yes. mic. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. I'm extremely thankful for a lot of things. And in particular this afternoon, I'm thankful that the citizens of, of the Nature Isle of the Caribbean, Dominica, can get such an opportunity to be part of this process in helping to determine and to be part of the process that impacts the nature oil where elections are concerned. Dominica truly is a democratic state. Um, I wrote down a little bit a while ago, a couple of things I just wanted to say quickly because I don't want to stray. So I'm most probably going to read it quickly. Um, concerning the report of Sir Byron, which I believe is like was quite a bit of excellent work, hard work. Um, 
While I am very fine with a number of suggestions that were being proposed, there are some things that are of concern to me as a proud citizen of this land. First of all, the issue of the voter registration and, and all of the, what was generated, all of the discussions that have been generated so far. Um, actually, this is my first consultation. I've been out of state, I came in over the weekend, so I'm so glad to be, finally be part of this. That um, I'm hearing of voters' lists and people removing um, voters from the list. That doesn't go down too nice with me. I heard persons talking about complete registration. And then I wonder, are we even thinking about the elderly of this country? Those who are incapable of moving around or even bedridden? And, um, but they are very much alert. They are listening to the daily news, even calling radio talk shows. How do we propose to begin to re-register the elderly in this land? Because they very much want to be part of the electoral process. They have been the forerunners of this land. And as for the idea of biometrics, are we going to carry them someplace to have them fingerprinted? Are we going to have them to go someplace to have photo IDs done for them so that they will be part of the electoral process? Um, we all know those persons. They are in our community. They have always been the Mababa and the Mr. Roy and the Maros. We have always known them. And even on election day, we know who they are. Is that what we can, my friend, is that what we can really offer? Is that what we are prepared to offer our elderly? Magwesa, all of us born either at Princess Margaret Hospital or in Buetica are bona fide citizens of Dominica. And when we registered to vote, we met certain requirements and our names were subsequently placed on the voters list, giving us the right to cast our votes for the government of our choice. Migrating for economic reasons, and a lot of us in here have done that. Migrating for economic reasons does not make us a non-Dominican. We are all Dominicans. Even when people die, we turn around years later and we say they were a good Dominican. I am of the firm belief that only death should remove your name from the voters list. Because obviously, you no longer require na your name to go and vote because you cannot vote at that time. We must not in no way impose any system on our country that will suppress voters to exercise their franchise. Of particular interest to me is campaign financing, like the brother just said. Why is it that some of us would just love to sit somewhere, talk, 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 do nothing, and want to use the finance of the country, little as it may be, small island, underpopulated, very little economic activity, would be so comfortable waiting to use that little money in the treasury to run our campaigns. If a party is unable to raise its own campaign funds, can I trust this party to be the next government in my country to raise funds to develop my country? 
the power, the, the, the party in power, mark you, the party in power may always be at an advantage. Because guess what? They have made friends over the years. They have made friends over the years. And their friends may just be willing to help them. But to have political parties sitting, criticizing the other, and you want to wait after they have worked hard and get some money in the treasury, come and sit down, take some of it, and try to hit them and campaign against them. This is a no-no for me. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I also wish to say that um, we do have, we've indicated at the outset of these, rec of these consultations that all of your points are being captured. We have a stenographer here tonight who is transcribing. Um, so we would appreciate if you can speak so that she can hear and that in between that you know we ensure that the all of the views can be can be captured so just be mindful of our stenographer who is here this evening and needs to hear all of the points as well this is also being recorded and um, we have mr paul bunch who was the next person with his hand up paul bunch Uh, the mic, can we check the mic for Mr. Bunch? Is it on? Just give us one minute. To, to, to. Yes. Good night. Good night. Good night. My name is Paul Bunch, better known as AAK, the mobile man, representing the Rosa South. Welcome and good night. Ladies and gentlemen, before the start of this consultation is happening, we are in people saying on the other side, I don't listen in. I don't go in nowhere. I don't want to be part of this thing. It's the government that doing everything. I don't be part of it. My Lord Jesus Christ. One man just come and talk, what Mr. Byron said, to push to them, and they're taking it and they're running away with it. I was part of the workers' party. I telling you, right? And I'm telling you, from the time that people know me, I was always on the front, all the time. All the time, all the time, all the time. But the mobile man lives change back and because of labor power. Labor is power. Ladies and gentlemen, I got sisters right in England. Our stepfather had passed away in January. They come down, they come down. The same barrels for three, they come, they sending down and spending hotels and give more man free five hundred dollars. They been coming down. It don't take us two months. My twin brother, may soul rest in peace. They come down back again, and they say they cannot vote. My sisters, I know that you have been hearing me. One in Antigua and one in England. You all have the right to come down and vote unless you are dead. Ladies and gentlemen, campaign reform. My Lord Jesus Christ, 
As you know, you know me already, I'll never support this thing to give any party for no campaign. To so have the leader by Zoom, Freedom Party is calling. Resi, you've got the leader. On the other side, Mr. Fountain, he said give him a chance in December. Where's him? But it take one man into this party who was a leader, the president. He that have everything flying, going everywhere, all about, taking all time limit, don't even counseling about election reform, all his mind on a million dollars and everything spending, not keeping the attention for people to understand what he's talking about. What a failure. People said, mobile man, you don't go in tongue. I say, of course, I will go to tongue. They say they will fight for rights. Everything on the radio, 600 people. My God, I ain't on talk on the block. But my ladies and gentlemen, this was just a failure. That's mean the people of Dominica not even concerned and interested of them of what are happening. Is when the time come back, you see some people. Mr. Mr. Bunch, um, but before I go, thank you. I have to say many thanks for the government of Dominica, which put my feet on top with this incompetent. Just take me and dump me behind the bus. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bunch. I would like to, I have a very difficult job here this evening. I mean, I spent 10 years as a lecturer, but this is going to be a very tough audience tonight. Um, before you, we, we have a few individuals who would have had their hands up. I would like to call on um, I would like to call on Ms. Cara Schlinfeld. Uh, please take the mic to her, please. And again, just a reminder to everyone, let's ensure that we can hear clearly what the speakers are saying. Speaking to the mic. Okay, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Okay, good evening, everyone. Can you, I'm not sure we can hear you as yet. Technicians? Okay, can you try again, please? Testing, testing. Yes, we can hear you testing. clearly now. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm very happy to be part of this consultation. Yes, she, she just started speaking, so go ahead. We can hear her now. Okay, I will try to speak as loudly as possible so that everyone can hear me. Okay, my name is Cara Schillingford. I'm an attorney at law and I have been involved in many election matters. So I am a bit familiar with the election laws of Dominica. I'm familiar with some of the problems that we have faced as Dominican citizens over the years. Now, my contribution here is as a Dominican citizen, someone who was born here, someone who lives here, someone who is only Dominican and who has nowhere else to go if it is that things turn bad here. So I have a genuine interest in preserving Dominica, preserving our democracy. Now this consultation isn't about politics. It's not about which party you support because regardless of whether you are blue, you are red, you are yellow, at the end of the day, you are a Dominican and you have a vested interest in maintaining our, our democracy. Democracy means that we, the people who are being governed, we the people in Dominica should have the right to choose who governs us. No, no foreign power should be governing us if it is that we decide we want to govern ourselves. Now, before I, I look at the, the provisions in, in the draft um, legislations, 
Let me just say that democracy and having a strong electoral system isn't about the outcome. It is not about which party wins. Because if it is that you have a weak system that is vulnerable to fraud or it's vulnerable to you know whichever group of people have the most money can buy it can manipulate it then you might have a, a cabinet or a parliament comprised of people who do not look like you and i people who are not from dominica people who perhaps bought their citizenship under the cbi pro program so you know in a country like dominica where in a country like dominica Uh, ladies in and a gentlemen, country like Dominica, can we allow, where hello. our main product is citizenship by investment. Uh, Ms. Shilinfa, we just give me one second. Just give me one second, please. I would like to... We need to have some, we need to have some order. I mean, this, this has to go... I said very early on when we started that we are going to have differing views. I would like us to allow the speaker on the floor to speak. I will stop them if we need to, but let us allow each person to speak, at least give them an opportunity to express their views. Also, as I have said before, there are a number of people here. We would like to get as many people to speak as possible. I would like to speak less. So can we please allow uh, the lady who's on the floor to continue her comments. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, as I was saying, you know, I'm going to tell the truth to you regardless of whether you like it or not because it is in your best interest. In a country like Dominica where citizenship is one of our main products and there, there are no different classes of citizens. Whether you bought your citizenship or you were born here, you are a citizen and you are entitled to vote. So when we are saying, oh, my brother and sister sent me a burial, et cetera, et cetera, we have to be careful about that. Just because someone sent a burial or someone paid $100,000 for citizenship does not mean that this person have the right to come and rule over you and I. Because the government of the day has a lot of power. The government of the day can compulsorily acquire your land. That is the government that is responsible for providing you with health care, roads. So we have to be careful about that. It is not about politics. It is not about who wins. It is about securing our, de our democracy and making sure that Dominica remains in the hands of Dominicans. Now, on the issue of... On the issue of whether there should be a five year or it should be increased to 10 years, I fully support that it should remain as five years because that is in the interest of democracy. Yes, we have siblings, we have family overseas who might be sending things for us every Christmas and visiting two weeks, you know, a year. But they are enjoying the healthcare system in their country, the education system in their country, the roads and magnificent bridges in their countries and they just visit every now and then. The people who have to deal with the healthcare system, the education system, they are the ones who should vote and determine which government, which group of people should govern them. Additionally, I have no difficulties with members of the diaspora. You know, they contribute, they love Dominica, etc. But I do not believe they should determine which government rules over us, people who are on the ground. I think that, I think that a solution to this problem would be to create a constituency for members of the diaspora so that they could have a say. You know, they they, there would be a diaspora constituency so that they can vote and their votes will go towards that constituency. On the issue of voter ID card or national ID card, what we have to consider is with a national ID card, can we have everyone who is a citizen, who is a national, will be entitled order, to this national ID card. Just as you are entitled to your passport, your social security card, you, you will be entitled to a national ID card. So what is the point? You know, the purpose of the voter ID card is to make sure that only eligible voters can get it. 
and so it is a if we're talking about preserving democracy it is a voter id card that we need you have other forms of national id like your passport for example you can use that if you need an id if we if we want to secure our democracy a voter id card is the way to go now in terms of the 50 day rule or 90 day rule i think it should be 90 days over the, a period of five years you should have visited for 90 days because if if you remove if you don't have that requirement then you dominicans we dominicans rather with sorry if there is no requirement to be in dominica then we will have a situation one day where foreigners may be ruling over us can we No, we are going to... Okay. We are going to allow Micheline Ford to wrap up and then we are going to move to another speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, we cannot have a productive discussion if we are unable to hear or listen to any of the points that are being raised. We have two or three hours. I'm not sure if we can last that long, but we have two or three hours to be here. And during that time, we would like to hear as many speakers as possible. When we keep interrupting, we lengthen the time. So, Micheline Ford, can we wrap up and then yes. we'll move to another speaker? Thank okay, you. Okay, so my final point is that in addition, in addition to the issue of the you know, the sale of citizenship, the fact that we are selling citizenship at an alarming rate. And the number of citizenships that we're selling might outnumber the number of voters who turn out on polling day at one point. In addition to that problem, we also have the fact that there are more Dominicans living outside of Dominica than inside of Dominica. In a country with that problem, where your population is so small and migration is ever increasing, then it would be an injustice to us Dominicans, it would be an injustice to our future generation for us to simply give up Dominica like that. Our ancestors for too long, we were brought from Africa hundreds of years ago. We fought long and hard to get a country where we belong I do not believe that it is right for us, this generation, to simply give Dominica up to, vo to foreigners, to make us so vulnerable. That is my contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much. We had, now, hold on, I am, I am not going to speak if you are on your feet. We have a number of individuals who have put their hand up. We are taking names, so I'm going to be calling on some of the people who have already put their hands up earlier. Okay, so we are going in order based on the hands that are already up, Mr. Charles, okay? Um, we had, we had, next, Sonia Williams, then we have Glenroy Coffey, and we had, so we'll go with these two, Sonia Williams and then Glenroy Coffey. Can we get a mic to Ms. Williams? I would like to urge again, there are a number of us who are here, I would like to remind all speakers to be as brief as possible, and also to remain on the point of the Sudanese Byron reports and the recommendations that are there. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening to Honorable Prime Minister Actin and other members of cabinet, members of the opposition, Dominicans, friends. Madam Chair, I'd like to crave your indulgence to read something from the report, from the conclusion, the final paragraph of the conclusion of Sir Byron's report. And I quote, I must empathize, emphasize, sorry, that my role is advisory involving the provision of recommendations to the government. 
I have dedicated time and care to thoroughly consider all aspects. My advice and recommendations have been independently, impartially, and objectively formulated without any bias or influence. I have now fulfilled this function and it is now the responsibility of the government to review the recommendations, conduct national consultations, and present the bills to parliament with or without modifications. With or without modifications for enactment into law. And I use that quote, brothers and sisters, because you hear all kinds of stories making it appear that, and we heard it, that Sir Byron was paid, that he was advised, and those things. And we know that not to be true. Now, there are two documents, and very thick documents. And I don't think we have time to read. No one individual can read those documents. But we have to be very careful what we extract from it. We cannot extract the negative or what we want to make negative and forget the essentials of those documents. Because we are guided by the principles in the Registration of Electors Act and the Registration of Electors Reg Resolution Regulation, sorry, 2023. Now, Madam Chair, respectfully, we say that we mustn't talk politics. I agree, but sometimes we cannot help. Because if we listen to what is being spewed out on the outside, and we do not educate our people properly, we are going to end up in problems. And I just want to say, that at the end of all those consultations, at the end of Sir Dennis' report and all the consultations, if we make life harder for somebody to cast their vote, then all our work would have been in vain. So the processes that we are going to follow, the processes that we are going into parliament with to become law in this country, have to be scrutinized, and we have to ensure that everybody is comfortable with. We have people who can understand the language inside there. We have people who can't. So we have to ensure that people understand the implications of what we get when we go to parliament with those two documents. Now, some people have just been concentrating on maybe three or four aspects of that report. Voters registration or nomination, renomination. Then we have campaign financing. Then we have and I'm, I don't like to use the, use the word diaspora. Dominicans living overseas. So that's what I'm going to refer to them for, among others. So we have other things, but I want to touch on the, first of all, the identification card. An identification card is an identification card is an identification card. And whether we call it voter's ID, whether we call it, ident whatever we call it, we have to make it in such a way that it can be used and used effectively. And that's my opinion. But we have to look at what we are putting on the car. And I hear people talking about fingerprinting is the best thing. If something makes you uncomfortable, it makes you uncomfortable. And if you cannot deal with it, then you cannot, cannot deal with it. Find a way to make it easier for us to vote. Now, the right of Dominicans living overseas. Um, I'm not even sure how to go with that one, you know. Because I'm not even talking about Baril and, and whatever. To me, we have exhausted that. I am talking about a Dominican who has probably served his or her country for years here and for whatever reason has to leave to cross the border. Are we, are we really going to deny that person the right to cast a vote? And I want to touch on the five years stay. I do not have a problem with that. What I have a difficulty with is the 90 days and the 50 days. Maths is not one of my strong points, but if somebody has to fulfill that 90 days, 
then that person has to leave wherever he or she is across the globe and come to Dominica every year for five years for two weeks or more. Now it's not like how we in Dominica and we happy and free, you know. Because when we in Dominica, we send an excuse, I can't come today, I, I sick. Something happened, I have to take my child to the doctor. The other systems do not work that way. We cannot catch a break. So we cannot make it difficult for Dominicans living overseas who have contributed, who continue to contribute. We cannot make it more difficult for them, Madam Chair. So we have to look at that. So no 90 days and no 50 days and no days. So if I can only get, my time finish now? No, Madam it's just Ch a signal. That's Madam okay. Chair, that's not fair to me. I'll say that, but anyway. The <laughs> okay, so we, we forget about the days in between the five years. The registration or re-registration or nomination, we have to find a way to make that easy access for people. And I am not sure if I am, I do not want to sound like a prophet of doom and gloom, but I see a lot of complications and implications in that registration there. There should be two reasons why somebody's name should be off the voters list. Two, if they die and if they decide they don't want to be on the voters list. So I can make that decision and say, you know something? I don't want to vote again. I don't want to be in Dominica thing. So take out my name on all your list. So I will go through the process and take off my name. And if, I, if somebody dies, then there should be a mechanism to, to take off the person's name. Campaign financing. Madam Chair, Dominicans have a, a, a culture. There's a culture in our electoral campaign. And if you cannot take the heat, come out in the kitchen. Because I think that people should be able to raise their finance money. And not only that, there is something that says you have to give an audit of every bill, every whatever. I wonder how many of us want to do that. I wonder how many of us want to do that. So, Madam Chair, I probably will have to like some people and come to every, you haven't got more consultations? I'll probably have to come to others for to finish, give my views. But anyway, finally, I want to say that when we bring our laws, our bills to parliament to become law, it should not make the right to vote a troublesome or difficult situation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Williams. Uh, just to add that if you are unable to give all of your comments now, as we've been saying, you can also send your comments in writing to the cabinet secretariat. I have to tell you, I have a list of about 25 people who have put their hands up so we're going to try to get through the list as quickly as we can. Mr. Glenroy Coffey? Yes, um, good night to everyone. Good night. Yes, let me say that um, I am one who is very, very in favor of consultation. I'm Glenroy Coffey from the Rosso Central constituency. Well, everybody knows me as Sosa, but that's not important. And I'm saying this, these forums should be used, you know, not to trade invectives at each other, but rather to hear the views of others, respect it, and see how well we can, you know, agree to disagree, but in, uh, by improving everything that we will say. Because you will have commonalities in what we say. You will have differences. All the commonalities may appear to be positive, but those differences, we can also make po some positive mil milestone in from it. So we must try to compose ourselves, respect each other's view, and let us move on. Okay, good. Let me say the emphasis here tonight is on Sir by, by Dennis Byron's report, and I took some time off to ensure that I understand at least most of the content of the report. And I must say, in there have some good work. And not everything that you will agree with or disagree with, but the point is, it's a starting point. But let me start by quoting something that Sir Byron said under his background on page 7. For those of you that have the book, on page 7, listen to what he said initially. I quote, quoted, from 2009 to 2019, various election observers participated in free general elections held during this period, 
submitted reports with suggestions for improving the electoral process in the Commonwealth of Dominica. However, it does not appear that the recommendations from various reports and consultations were implemented prior to the last general election. End of quote. Right. So it means that, say, Dennis Byron is agreeing that many consultations have been held before or prior to his report or his submission of his report, and recommendations were made, and so they were not, well, reports and recommendations were made, but they were not actually driven to enactment of law. So he's admitting that. Under the review of existing reports, page nine, under the review, these recommendations were presented to the Commonwealth of Dominica over the years on the matter of electoral reform. I can report, that's Dennis Byron, open quote. I can report that the various recommendations all point in the same direction. He's talking about recommendations that have been submitted before or prior to his report, right? The challenges identified are consistent with the various general election observer reports as well as the Pauline Welch consultant report of 2017 and its addendum, which recommended several legislative amendments to the Registration Act, Electors Act, and the Registration of Electors Regulation to improve the voter registration procedures and to provide for all verification exercise of the voters list. Why do I say that? I say that because it is important that we expedite the whole process of electoral reform. According to Sir Dennis Byron's report, majority of 53 or more percent of persons say they agree that we need electoral reform. That's what we say, that the report says that. Which means that Dominicans were interviewed, even if it was a sample size used, it was well within the sample range, the, the, uh, the whole methodology used, brought 600, 744 people interviewed, and they come up with more persons who want electoral reform. So we are agreeing that we need electoral reform. Let us go in terms of the voter ID card, because I want to be very short, and just two more points I'll make after that. The voter identification card is very important, and I say so as a stakeholder, not necessarily affiliated with any party. I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm a Dominican, and obviously I'm a stakeholder, I'm a voter, I'm a stakeholder. And let me say that the voter identification card identifies someone and links someone with a constituency. So we know about the biometrics and everything. You talk about your age, your, 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 your date of birth and so on. But it's a simple thing. We need a voter ID card, and that is what I'm suggesting. You may have... <laughs> okay? Right. In terms of the reports, in terms of the reports, in terms, in terms of the report, in Dennis Byron's report, he says too that it appears that we may have to have registering offices outside of Dominica. You hear that? Outside of Dominica. Let me tell you. Let me tell you how, 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 how bad that is. Let me tell you how bad that is. If you open an office, if you open a registering office in New York, and can you did not... Hold on, Mr. Coffey. Madam Moderator, can you take can control of this some? meeting, please? Madam Moderator, can you take control am, of this I'm meeting, already, please? Mr. I'm already speaking, Mr. Coffey. Um, my, mic, my mic is not loud. Sorry. Can you all hear me? Yes. Couple okay, more minutes. Okay, you have two points. Can we allow Mr. Coffey to wrap up, please? For those of us who are speaking, I'm saying again, that everyone will get an opportunity. So can we allow Mr. Coffey to wrap up? Yes, yes, right. So I was saying, if you open an office in New York for Dominicans to register, and you fail to open an, an office in Paris, France, then you are disenfranchising Dominicans who live in France. So I'm saying if you cannot open everywhere in the world, you must come to Dominica to register wherever you live. But I'm not against anybody coming to vote. Is that clear? Right. And in terms of, and Mr. Irish, I want to thank you for that very good point that you made with respect to the DEF certificates and linking it to the registry. I could not have understood that for many years, that you have a quasi-organization, the registry is here. The electoral office could link with the registry to get all information that regarding the death of a person. When you die, that's, that, that is registered. 
When you are born, that is registered. When you are married, that is registered at the registry. When you bought, if someone bought land, that is registered. And my final point I want to say, my final point, while it is very important, I would like to know where is the electoral commission in all of this? Because prior to what, prior to Dennis Byron's report, remember he says that there were all the consultation and recommendations made. But remember, the electoral office is mandated by law to carry out its function. Has the electoral office went to sleep? Has the electoral arm commission go gone to sleep? Because it appears to me that they have abdicated their responsibility. Because even in the absence of Dennis Byron's report, we could have had at least basic electoral reform. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Coffey. So then I'm going to call the next three speakers. We have, I would like to recognize the mayor, I mean, Roye. And then we have Mr. Ronald Charles. And then we have, I'm going based on my list, take it easy. And then we have Ms. Coralie Thomas. Okay, so these three speakers, Mayor Ermin Roye, Mr. Ronald Charles, and Coralie Thomas. Mayor, can we allow the mayor to speak, please? Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Protocol has already been established. Um, I'll start by saying my name. name I'm Ermin Roe, the mayor of the city of Roseau. Firstly, I would like to ask to extend a hearty welcome to all overseas observers, ministers of government present, and to all others others in the committee who gather here this evening to share their views on the election reform. Madam Chair, I highly recommend you and your entire team on the manner in which you have conducted this consultation session over the past weeks. Though I have, mis though I have studied Mr. Byron's report, I wish to thank and commend the Attorney General for your overview, which has most certainly assisted me, and I can say others as well, in the manner in which you have really simplified it. But Madam Chair, it would be remiss of me not to also compliment the Dominica Labour Party government for openly bringing the election reform process to the public. And thanks to all Dominican national for their expression and views on the subject matter. Having said that, Madam Chair, I have listened to all views expressed. I followed the consultation throughout. I would like to make my area of concern short, brief remark. Firstly, I wish to state the right to vote in Dominica should be given to all citizens of the country, irrespective of, of their presence, residence, or any length of time. I concur all views expressed in like manner. Secondly, on the question of the matter of campaign financing. I am in support of the views expressed by many that it should not be the responsibility of the government to fund any political party campaign. In any election whatsoever, Madam Chair, let me say my position as mayor My position as mayor is an elected one, and I am fully aware of what it takes to be elected. Just as it is my responsibility and duty to meet and appeal with people for their votes at no cost of the government, 
so too it must remain for every process of election. Thirdly, cleansing of the election voters list should not be used to remove any citizen who has already been legally, correctly registered to vote unless they are certified dead. In closing, the idea of term limits for the Prime Minister fixed date for election just cannot be and should not be considered or accepted. It does not suit our culture of governance in this country. Let me end by saying I have asked questions to many who want change. I mean negative change. What is wrong with our election system? The answer returns nothing, but we need change. Change for what, Madam Chair? What kind of change? The only change we need is that the equal right for all citizens to remain in good practice. I will stop there, Madam Chair, because the time is short. Thank you. Thank you. I wish all of our speakers would be as brief as the mayor, so I don't have to, to stop you. Apparently, we have two Ronald Charles, and they both want to speak. So we will take, we will, we will take the Ronald Charles. They have, <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we have. Thank you, Madam Chair. They've dis they've decided on which Ronald Charles will go first. So go ahead, sir. And Madam then we'll Chair. have the second Ronald Charles. Madam Chair, Can we please hold on before you start, Mr. Charles? No. Nope. I just want us to come down before both of the Ronald Charleses start speaking. Okay, thank you very much. Go ahead, please. Yeah, Madam Chair, there is uh, the same Ronald Charles, and there is the original Ronald Charles. <laughs> Madam Chair, I stand here, and I want to say unequivocally, there should be no beating around the bush with the diaspora vote. I have never seen anywhere in the world where a government is taking away from its citizens rights and privileges that they already have. They have a right to vote. Why are we taking it away? Why are we talking about taking away the rights that our citizens already have? They already have it. I've never heard, Madam Chair, any example of any country, anywhere, where we haven't been involved in electoral modernization where people have been denied of their existing rights. I've never heard, I've never heard of the benefits or even the, um, those who promote the, against the diaspora vote. They've never mentioned the St. Kitts thing, the St. Kitts example, where St. Kitts, a small country like us, struggling like us, have allowed their diaspora, their people outside, to vote. And they are yet to convince me, they are yet, yet to convince me that the vast majority of our people overseas come home to vote. We all agree. We all agree that we have a large diaspora of people, Dominicans living overseas, a large population. We all agree. How many of them overseas are already were registered before they left Dominica. And how many of those who, lay, who have already registered come back to vote? Bring out the statistics. How many of them come back to vote? Bring out the statistics. We had about, eight, in 2019, 8,000 people came to vote. That is the difference between the parties. Remind me of Donald Trump. I want 11,780 votes. Just one more. Brothers and sisters, we have to get serious. We have to get serious. And government, we are here tonight because the government's efforts to frustrate fixing up the problem that we say we have, or, or rather, government's effort to, um, to fix up the problem we have tonight was frustrated back in 2018. We have, vo we have voice clips. We have press releases. 
where the opposition said they agreed to the amendments that Dominica was going to make. It's all over the place. One week later, uh, 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 an injunction filed to prevent government from going ahead with the, um, with the amendments. It is a fact. We know that. Already, say, already say I'm, I'm lying. Anybody heard the leader of the said that we agreed to the amendments? Shouting, he lying. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, voters ID. Voters ID. And some of us think that because of voters ID, if we get a, vo a, a card in my pocket to be used once every five years, that will put me in government. How can it be, brothers and sisters? Two weeks ago at the State House, a gentleman calling from the United States or Canada, he mentioned and speaking about the constituency associates and constituency, or rather the virtual constituency. When he was asked how it will work, what he said, unleash the power of the young people, they'll find an, an, a, a, a solution. A day later, another gentleman came and he said about the the, 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 um, the, the bloated voters list I can be cleansed in a sharp time how do you do that? unleash the power of the young people with their skills and technology I am saying tonight we can also unleash the power of the young people to design a national voter ID card that can, a national ID card that can be used for voting and everything else Unleash the power of the young people. We should not only unleash them for what we want. Unleash them the power and their skills and their know-how for everything. And so, brothers and sisters, I'm not too sure what is the particular advantage. Registration. Re-registration. And all, all our minds are on the diaspora vote. All of us on the diaspora. Do you know how many of our citizens live in Dominica will be disenfranchised? And I and I heard a, a former prime minister made a passing comment about Vince Vince's constituency, you know, and the fingerprinting. You know, I mean, how sad. How sad it is for us. We have senior citizens at their home. We have to take them and bring them somewhere to finger and print. Turn your fingers. No, so, look so, look so. Take their picture, all kind of things. Just people just decide, I'm not in that, you know. And that's, that's what we want, people to, to be disenfranchised, people to stay away. We want everybody to vote. And any election modernization process has to support and encourage people, who, wherever you are, to come and vote. Come out and vote. Make it easier for people to vote, not harder for people to vote. Election campaign. You recall some time ago there were some rich friends and family in Europe? Huh? Yeah. Rich friends, I lie, you know that one? Rich friends and families in Europe supported our party. You remember some time ago somebody was, was chosen to be leader because of his expertise in fundraising? Am I lying? Experts in fundraising as a fundamental criteria to be leader. We're talking today about campaign financing, states, and then they say we're lying. That's not what they said. They said something else. Give us a break, man. We understand. I stammer, right? You I stammer, but I read English very well. I read and understand English very well. So, I see my boy. <laughs> yes, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Charles. We have another Mr. Charles to go. Yeah. So let's. You know, so, Madam, Madam Chair, this week there, I came away very, very saddened by the onslaught that was unleashed on the diaspora vote. Suddenly, our diaspora people have no value to us. Suddenly, our people living in the diaspora means nothing to us. We forget that they put their money in the banks that we use, that we borrow from the bank. We forget that. We forget that they build houses here. They pay VAT. 
They pay taxes, they rent. Okay? We forget that. Suddenly, because of a partisan expediency, because of partisan reasons, our people living in the diaspora means nothing to us in Dominica. How sad. How sad. But let the people of Dominica talk. Let the people, they like to say the people, here have almost more, more individuals than was in the Rose last week. Okay? Let the people talk. Sorry, Mr. Charles, before you continue, we have just a slight change. We have, are having an issue with our audio, so we are going to raise our speakers. Just give us two minutes. Just let me know when we are back on. Okay, and we, we're back on. Can you go ahead, Mr. Charles? The okay, we are reconnecting. We also need the screens back on. All right, uh, the Zoom is still on, the observers are still on, they're just not showing on the screen as yet. But they are on. We are con my office is confirming that they are on Mr. Charles. So let's go ahead, we'll get them back on the screen shortly. Okay, good evening to everybody. A special good evening to the head table and the acting prime minister in our midst. Good evening to you. And of course, the observers and all the other dignitaries in our midst. The President of the United Workers' Party, Mr. Lennox Linton, is in our midst. Good evening to you, sir. And of course, I want to kick off from where my friend left off, Mr. Ronald Charles. And he said, let the people talk. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not here on a political platform. I'm not here to bring down anyone. I'm here to consult with the people of Dominica. You may like me, you may not like me, you may like my party, you may not like my party, but we are one Dominican. So while I say this, Let me start off from page five of the report, Electoral Reform Commonwealth of Dominica, and it states this. And this is very interesting, and I'm not here, I'm just here to give my remarks. The Association of Caribbean Election Organization has been in existence since about 1998. It brings together election officials from approximately 22 countries and dependent territories. It went on further to say, and that is from Mr. Byron's report, campaign financing has been on its agenda as part of the anti-corruption, 
architecture and to minimize conflict of interest by those holding political office. It went on further to say, in Dominica, the issue of election campaign financing has been on the political agenda for more than half a century. Well, I'm not good at maths. But half of a century mean over 50 years. The other thing I want to say is that, which is interesting, Madam Moderator, I'm hearing the confusion about campaign of political parties. And direct me. Please direct me because I'm going through the report page by page. And if you can tell me where in the report this has emerged as an issue of, Mr. of, of Mr. Byron, please, uh, please let me know. Because it appears to me that the remarks that have been coming out of this consultation dated the 28th of August 2023 at the Goodwill Parish Hall seems to be driving an issue that was not pronunciated by our good friend, the acting, the, the attorney general. He outlined certain issues of concern. He did not, under no circumstances, highlighted any area of campaign of political parties, which I suspect want to be driven as a non-issue so that it can instigate untruths about a party that is no longer the opposition party. So, Madam Moderator, let me say this for the record. I heard our Attorney General speak of the voter's ID card. And he said, it may just be a situation of call it what you want. Words to that effect. So you can call it national ID, you can call it voter's ID, but you know what I mean, whatever name it is, we know where we're going with it. I will ask one question to the Attorney General, one of the highest offices in Dominica. The question I wish to ask, Madam Moderator, if you are stopped by a police officer while driving a motor vehicle, would he ask you for your national ID or your driver's license? <laughs> Madam Moderator, if you could help me, please. And your, your, your conduct of this consultation is admirable. And, and I know that you have a very good calm voice that my so I'll wait until it's calmed down. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if you were to go to the social security and you have an issue with your returns, would they ask you for your voter's ID card? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if you are stopped by the police and he or she would, you know, oh, oh, sorry, well, I mean, arrest you, would he ask you for your voter's ID card or your ID? What would he ask you for? I said this to say, ladies and gentlemen. Can we have some order, please? My mic is. Ladies and gentlemen, can we have some order, please? We are extending, we are extending this for a much longer time than we need to. So let's allow Mr. Charles to wrap up so that we can move to the next speaker. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, therefore, Madam Chairperson, if one were to travel from one jurisdiction to the other and they have to go through the airport, would they ask them for their voter's ID card? They would ask them for their passport. And therefore, Madam Speaker, I appreciate this consultation. 
If I'm in a line to vote, I want the invigilator, the registered officer, to ask me for my voter's ID card. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, we should not, according to the famous saying, we should not shift too far or drift too far. We must not drift too far. We must remain where we have to. So, Mr. Mr. Attorney General, please, there is a significant difference. I believe, and this is me speaking, because I'm also from the Rose Valley, we need to do the re-registration. Ladies and gentlemen, think about it. Think about it. In America, you have millions of people. In India, you have millions of people. In Jamaica, you have millions of people. In Dominica, let's say we touch and concern about 70,000 with 50,000 being permanent residents. So therefore, ladies and gentlemen, I believe what is wrong with it? What is wrong? Ladies and gentlemen, go into your heart and ask yourself for the generation to come, what is wrong in doing the correct things? Nothing is wrong with it. Ladies and gentlemen, let me move on. Well, I compete. I was once a candidate for the Rose Valley twice. Well, <laughs> she said. And ladies and gentlemen, the issue of the media and the state-owned media being equal to everybody is fundamental to our de de democracy. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, I know in my constituency, for example, there are elderly persons who only listen to DBS radio. And therefore, that equal opportunity is fundamental to our democracy. Let's try to wrap up, Mr. Charles. Thank you, Madam. We have Margarita. about 20 speakers to go, 25. Thank you. Th that, is, that is good. I will just say one thing for the record. I am happy that the international observers are there. And I'm saying directly to them that their observation that have been gathered throughout these consultations must be copious and their notes must be directed in a way that would not take away the voices of the people so we are waiting on your recommendations let Thank me you. say this further and this is for my friends at GIS huh? to my friends at GIS let's wrap up Mr. Charles. I could be subjected to corrections okay I'm a fella if, if, if I am wrong, the records are here, I will say, well, I was wrong. But I've been observing the replays of these consultations. And I would just ask that it be balanced. That's all I ask for. That's all. And let me say, as an attorney at law, we are looking forward to be able to move this consultation to the next level. Our people are good people. Our people are thinking people. Dominicans as a people, we can do it. We can make the changes so that we all will be on a level playing field. This Thank is you. not about Dr. Daru. This is not about Ronald Charles. This is not about my good friend. This is not about Mr. Linton. This is about our... Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Charles. Could I finish, please? And therefore, this is not about
just one set of us. This is for the next generation to come. Please think of your children while you make your decision. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Charles. Let's have Cor Coralie Thomas. Coralie Thomas, can you stand and take the mic, please? Madam, Madam, can we please come down so Coralie Charles can speak? Coralie Thomas, sorry, is on the floor. Madam Chair, is it possible? Is it possible that I can use the podium because I don't like to speak and give my back to people either way? So, is it possible I can use the podium? Um, let's, uh, Miss Thomas, you can speak. We can, you can turn if you would like. But let's, yes, because I would like to have the opportunity. Okay. Good evening, everyone. You can turn around to okay. face the audience. Okay. Please. Sorry if you get my back when I'm turning. I apologize in advance. My name is Coralie Thomas, and I am a registered voter in the Commonwealth of Dominica. My very first vote I voted was for the Freedom Party. Twice after that, I voted for the Dominica Labor Party. And I will continue to vote for the Dominica Labor Party until I choose otherwise. <laughs> Madam Chair, I have just about two or three points shortly to touch on. The first one I want to touch on is the voter's ID. And to the gentleman that was just speaking, I have one question. Let's say, well, the others are here, so they're, they're listening, and they're listening. Let's say that we get a voter's ID card, and it just so happened that any one of us in the room lose that card, and election is tomorrow or next week. Can I use my driver's license, my social security, or my passport to vote? I would really like a question, an answer to that question. And if the answer is yes, then why do I need a voter's ID card just for once every five years? That is the question that we have to answer. The second thing I want to touch on, just for the record's sake, Madam Chair, I lived in Canada for pretty close to 30 years. I decided to move back to Dominica in 2019. Election was called in Canada in June of 2022. For the record, this is my voting information card that was sent to me in the mail with instructions of how and where I can vote, whether it be online, whether I come in person, or whether I st in Canada. This is what that was sent to me. And as a registered patriotic Dominican, you want to give me criteria on how I should vote with 50 and 90 days? You, you, you must be kidding me. You cannot, you cannot give me criteria. I'm a registered voter. You cannot give me no 15, no 90, no five years, no whatever. I will fight for my rights. And I believe I believe, Madam Chair, I am starting to get that feeling of somebody is trying to put Dominicans to sit back in the bus. Rosa Parks and others has fought too hard for women and everybody to vote. And for somebody, for somebody to be sitting in a very cold AC office and want to dictate to Dominicans how and where and how we can vote. We will not. We will not put up with that. So you can take the message back to them that we in the small island, as they like to call us, we, we, will vote, we will vote for who we choose to vote. And we have been choosing the Dominica Labor Party. And when we choose otherwise, you ma you're not even getting a chance. So let's not even go there. Madam Chair, my final point. My final point, Madam Chair, is on the idea that dead people vote. I've never heard things more ludicrous than that. This is just, Madam Chair, my father died in 2019 in Canada, and I can guarantee you that he did not vote in the two last election in Woodford Hill. Because if he did, the whole of Woodford Hill Village would leave Woodford Hill. 
because he didn't leave Canada as a dead man and come to vote. And finally, Madam Chair, I just want to say on the whole diaspora thing, you want to prevent diasporans or Dominicans living abroad to come down and vote, but yet still you want a diaspora constituency, a virtual constituency. That doesn't make sense to me. Like, I mean, if you want to come and present something, make it make sense. Let it gel. Don't just come and say things and say things and say things. Because guess what? Some of us will listen and some of us will read. And I've been reading that. And if you want to pick and choose whatever you want to fight for, I am going to pick and I'm going to choose to fight to vote. And as long as I am in Dominica and I am a registered Dominican, Nobody will prevent me from voting. And Madam Chair, finally, I'm going to stress again, I would really love the question to be answered. If we get a voter's ID card, which I'm not for, national ID card, but just if in case, and I lose it, please tell me what other form of identification I can use to vote. And if you tell me my driver's license, my passport, and my social security, you answer your own question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before we, before we continue, uh, a few questions or comments have been posed to the Attorney General, so I'd like to give him an opportunity to respond, and then we'll go to the next round of speakers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the first thing before I... I address the specific question. Just to say a number of people have been raising the issue of death and, and the connection between the registrar or the registry and the electoral office. There is a process in law as it exists at the moment and indeed the registrar sends the name of deceased people to the electoral office on a regular basis. Um, those names are copied uh, to the Attorney General. So I am telling you what I am aware of. What happens when they get there, I can't actually speak of at the moment, but I would imagine that names have been removed. So there is a process, and it's a process that's in the existing legislation to provide for that. It is also in Sir Dennis's um, draft. That's number one. Number two, Electoral Commission. The Electoral Commission, I've addressed that previously, but just to repeat, the Electoral Commission's rule is set out in Section 38 of the Constitution. Those of you who wish to read it can read it subsequently. It is limited to what they are entitled and ri rightly supposed to do. And in respect to this actual uh, electoral reform, electoral modernization process, what is required is that the legislation, before it goes to Parliament, must be sent, submitted to the Electoral Commission. It will be submitted through the President to the Electoral Commission for them to review and make their comments. That is at section 51 of the Constitution. So though you can look at section 38, you can look at section 51 of the Constitution. But finally, in response to um, my legal colleague, colleague um, the Ronald, Ronald Charles II, and his, um, <coughs> his reference to the identification cards and his question to the Attorney General as to if the Attorney General was stopped by a police officer and what would the police officer ask for? Would, it, would he not ask for uh, a driver's license? The point that I made, because um, Mr. Charles didn't quote me accurately, the point I was making is that what is important is not what you call the card, but what its purpose is and what the information on it does in terms of achieving the purpose. So to use his example of the police officer, if the police officer stopped Levi Peter and asked Levi Peter for his driver's license, and Levi Peter gave the police officer a, a driver's license with the name and details of Ronald Charles, it would not assist the police officer very greatly, would it? Because it would be incorrect and it would not be that of the right person. So in other words, what is important for the identification card, whatever you call it, is will it provide sufficient information to enable the officials at the electoral office, the polling station, to be satisfied that the person presenting it is the person who should be presenting it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eiji. Uh, I'm going to call on, there's a Mr. Brown. 
Um, we have also Mr. Ashworth Simon, then Mr. Jai Zaya Binwa, and Mr. Sherman Boston. And then we'll take another round. Um, is Mr. Can we take the mic to Mr. Brown? Oh, Ash. Ashwell Simon is Mr. Brown? Okay. <laughs> that shortens our list then. Go ahead, Mr. Simon. Uh, hold on, your mic is not yet on. Can we just check his mic for him, please? Go ahead, try to speak into the mic. Thank you very much, Madam Chairperson. And please excuse me for not being able to stand. Okay? It's okay. Yeah, I want to say a very um, protocol. Deputy, Deputy, our acting Prime Minister, sorry, members of cabinet, our humble um, observers. DBS, I have to pick you up because you, have my, you give me all of them at my home. I have to pick you up tonight to, for everybody to hear. So you bring it live. And, and I want to say, my fellow Dominicans, my compatriots, Dominicans, uh, Madam Speaker, tonight I am here very briefly. And the reason why I am here tonight in my physical condition is because I have some disappointments disappointments two disappointments one is a small one and the other one is a big one so I'll take this small one first I am disappointed in Sir Dennis Byron and why I am disappointed in him is because when I got a copy of the report just about two one to eight days ago probably a little more than that I couldn't go through all the report but when I get to page 5 of 18, I saw something there that disappointed in me. I saw the word mandate. And when I saw that word, it hit me. And you know why? Because we all know the amount of debate, the amount of talk, the amount of things people was talking about getting to understand the, what was the mandate. And we get no information on that. Right now we have the report. So seeing that Sir Dennis mentioned that there, I thought he would at least give us a little praise, see a little thing, you know, a little short explanation as to what the mandate was. He didn't have to give us the whole thing. Just give us a little thing. But he didn't. I was disappointed in that. That's my small disappointment. And the other thing I find some of his some of the things he, he, he his, his conclusions the hey for a, a little person i find they were a little bit and anyway my big disappointment is in us we dominicans and i'm bigging up dbs because i listen to every one of them from the first time unless if dbs go out i think when they win marry got they went off and when it have cricket i watch my cpl on my TV and I listen on the radio. When it haven't got cricket, I watch it on my TV. And I'm disappointed in us. And the reaction here tonight is the worst. I'm not putting water in my mouth. And I'm, boy. So, why am I disappointed in my people? It's because that thing Mr. Dennis give us there is not a joke. That is not a joke. That, I, I put that in comparison to God giving Moses the Ten Commandments. The difference is God gave Moses the commandments. He tell him what we should and shouldn't do. Sorry. But in that, in that thing, in that thing, it is giving us an opportunity for us to say what we want for ourselves as Dominicans. And all the ninety percent of what I've heard already is just subjective. Subjective. People there as those campaign they campaigning. 
and they don't see the value of what we're doing that hurt me. And that's why I said, I don't care what happened, I don't care how, but I want to be there to make my point. Because if I didn't, if I couldn't make it here tonight, I don't think I would die a happy man. Because I would be disappointed. And you know, it's because that thing there, we're talking about you know, that reform. A lot of things that happen in Dominica, and that reform is essential. Because I can bring our minds back to two incidents. One happened in 1975, and it's happening up till this day in our election. And the other one happened in 1985. It has never happened again. I, I will tell you, don't be too harsh. I don't give you nothing halfway. When I come, I come to tell you what I come to tell you, hoping that you will learn from what I tell you. Okay, so my people, I, that is my disappointment in you. Now, I want to move to my second point. I have only three points here, four points here, but I have a lot of suggestions. Okay? Electoral Commission, my brothers and sisters, I lost faith in that office since after the 1985 election. I don't know about all you, I never go there. I lost faith in that office since after the 1985 election. And we should know what happened in the 1985 election. After, how could you, as an electoral office, hoping to lead people in the right way, after a party contested an election in 1985 with a symbol, in the 1990 election, another party have the symbol without you informing the party that you're giving away its symbol. Oh, you know this so? Of course. And let me tell you something. That is no joke. That is no joke. And you know why it is not no joke? Some of us, there's a saying that say you train a child the way the child should go. And if you don't, then the child go, will go astray. It also said you check a plant the way you want it to go because if you alter the plant, it will go in a way you don't want it to grow. And what happened? That is why today I hear some people asking why some people behaving so. But to me, if you do something wrong from your first time, your first time, you go believe every wrong thing right. And that is my point. If you do something right from the beginning, you get away with it, you're going to believe everything right. That is why and I'm not there for party, and because let me tell you, it, 1970 election, I was 17 years, 11 months, and 26 days. I could not get, I could not get registered before the election. No, I, but it's the report, election we're talking about, election we're talking about, election we're talking about, and brothers. 1975, I vote for every party already, you know. Every party. Every party. Labor in 75. Alliance, no, yes. Freedom in 75. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Labor, no boy. Anyway. Anyway, the point is because let's, I don't let's round up, Mr. I don't want to take time. Yes, I come yes. in. Yes. So, therefore, I want to say that, okay? When we come to the, on page 19, um, 11 of 19, Dr. Byron said on the composition, I want to suggest a new composition for the Electoral Commission. A new thing. You see, I will keep one thing. I will keep one thing. The president will elect the chairman. And after that, all political parties have to get together and choose one. All of all you, all of you are agree now, all you have to go and agree to choose one. Because what we do is we want to bring ourselves together. We want to work as a whole. All churches go together and choose one. All business and other interests go together and choose one. And then the last one, the National Youth Council. Get it with one observation. If National Youth Council have anybody that below 18, they cannot be qualified. Because I will not support we putting our children on the electoral list at age 17. We see what happened. We, 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 yeah. 
Okay, my 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 time now is up. When it come, when it come to the diaspora and the voting and all that kind of thing there. All right, we have to do certain things. I want also to suggest the social security has a template where they contact people and they get to know certain things. We cannot do everything like social security, send people overseas and them kind of thing. But we, what we can do, we can use that template to get to our people who are registered. I'm not in favor of taking out nobody's name on the list on the, unless you verify them. I'm saying that. And what I'm saying is we can verify. We can verify. So if you see five years somebody to vote, ten years somebody to vote, you send in the personal letter just like social security do. Send us a letter and say you are alive and them kind of thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Simon, I'm sorry I have to cut you short, but thank you very much for... Your last point, okay. One minute. Go ahead. Okay, my brothers, in concluding, I want to say that the voting ID card is useless. A national ID card is what we need because we can put all the other information into it, okay? And I, all, I, and I want in concluding, I want to say thank you to all them people, even them fellas that carry me, carry me up the step on the wheelchair, two guys. Yeah, I know, but I say in sense, I'm not, I'm not a useful idiot, you know. I am not a useful idiot, okay? And I thank want to you. say to my people, let us use that, that situation now for us to bring our country together. Because we have a thing saying, my last thing I gonna say. That is okay. the second last. No, last, 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 last thing. We sing in our national anthem. All for each and each for all. Let us make that a reality and stop fighting over nothing subjectively. Let Thank us you. The over thing. Thank Go you very much. Mr. Thank you very much for those. Thank you very much for those recommendations. Um, Mr. Simon or Brown made mention of the youth. I have not heard many young people. There is a young lady who would like to speak, Ms. Bell. I would like to give her the opportunity and then we'll take Mr. Jaisaya Binwa and uh, Mr. Boston. Good night. Good night, go ahead. Can you hear me clearly? We can hear you very clearly, go ahead. All right. Um, in terms of the ID for the electoral reform, I think that there should be an ID as many youth, especially those who just turned 18, do not yet have a driver's license and do not work, so they don't have a social security card, it would benefit them to have an ID. And our precious passport is not something that we walk around with in our bag every day, and it's kind of a hassle to have it. You don't want to risk it. However, the national ID should be a choice. We should not be forced into making a decision to have one. And also, if you want youth to get a national ID, we are not really in favor of the biometrics. We do not want to put all our information on a card for anyone to have like that. That's it, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Ms. Bell. To the point on a very specific matter. Um, let's take Mr. Jaisaya Binwa. I believe he's another young person. Yes. Good night. Let's settle down, please. Yes. Mr. Binwa, go ahead. Good night, good night. I don't know, my mic is giving me some problem. Yeah, we are not check hearing Mr. Mr. Binwa. Can we check the mic, please? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'd like to say a pleasant good evening to the acting Prime Minister, also to members of the government, the cabinet, government officials, also to Dominicans present and those in the diaspora. Good evening, everybody. Um, Madam Chair, I really must start out by saying it's unfortunate that we have a lot of misdirection and misinformation taking place at this forum. It's supposed to be a public forum where people share ideas, not come to try to mislead the public. 
because I sat and listened to Miss Shiddingford, one of your previous speakers, and the observer should take note that she's trying to insinuate that what she's speaking is the truth. But I want to inform you that what you're speaking is just your personal opinion, and you shouldn't give anybody the, in the diaspora the opinion that you're speaking any gospel truth here. Because you make some comments about the CDI, and you're actually insinuating that when somebody becomes a citizen by virtue of the citizenship by investment program, they automatically go onto the voters' list, and that is not true. That is not true. And that is what you were insinuating. If you purchase your citizenship, there is no automatic going on to the voters list. You have to come and you have to register for you to go on the voters list. So we must be honest. And your comments were very xenophobic. Your comments were very xenophobic. And xenophobia is the dislike of people or prejudice against people from other countries. Why are you so prejudiced against those that are coming from abroad and investing in Dominica? We welcome our CBI citizens. We welcome all Dominicans that are born in Dominica, as well as those that buy their citizenship and support the country. So we are not xenophobic in this country. Me Madam Chair, moving on to the context of our consultation tonight. I sat there and for a second I, I was wondering if I was in a European country or in a Scandinavian country. I mean, we are in Dominica, which we call a small island developing state. It is located in the Caribbean, which is, you know, in the West Indies, which we, sub we were subjected to over 400 years of the transatlantic slave trade. And prior to the slave trade, us as black people and Kalinago people, we had every single right given to us by God. And during the transatlantic slave trade, we had no rights. And hundreds and thousands and millions of our forefathers and ancestors died for us to get those rights. And here we are today, here we are today, throwing them away like they have no value. People like Jaco and Bala would be turning their graves if they see Dominican throwing away their right to vote like that today. Madam Chair, what I've seen happening here, it seems to me anybody with, that is Dominican, we have common sense. And we like to say, say, obviously, when something is not making any sense. There are some recommendations, I would say, that don't make any sense to me. And it seems obvious to me, like somebody is trying to put layers and barriers to prevent me from voting. Barriers and barriers and layers to prevent me from voting, Madam Speaker. Sorry, um, Madam Chair. Okay? And if you look at I just want to, before I go into the barriers, let's look at the campaign financing. Campaign financing, they said that it's been up for discussion for so long. But my one point, or why, my one contention with the recommendations of Sir Byron is his point about campaign finance limits. I don't see any point in limiting the amount of capital that a political party can raise. First of all, we're in a very economically challenged space and we need to raise as much funds as we can. Now look at history in the United States of America where the first black president emerged by taking the decision to forego campaign finance from the treasury. That is to say he said he didn't want any finance from the American treasury. And he raised almost a billion dollars on his own. If you had set a limit on Barack Obama, arguably he would not have been the first black president in the history of the United States of America. And we're looking forward to dynamic leaders like Barack Obama coming from Dominica, just like Roosevelt Skerritt and those that have gone before him. So we don't want to set any limits to campaign finance, Madam Chair. Next, on the issue of voter ID cards, I want to thank Ms. Shilling Ford for her very emphatic presentation because I've been listening for weeks and months and even tonight, and I cannot hear one speaker give me a logical reason for the need for a national identification card. There is no logical reason. We have a passport, we have a social security card, we have a driver's license. Now, even in the post-terrorism era, I can still travel to a CARICOM country on my driver's license or my social security. So I can travel abroad and go through all of the checkpoints at a, in an airport, and you're telling me I cannot go into a ballot box and vote, a polling station and vote? That doesn't make any sense to me. That doesn't make any sense to me. I personally believe this, this card is useless and we have established mechanisms by which we can identify a Dominican citizen. This voter ID card is just the first barrier to prevent you from voting. The next barrier is the so-called verification or re-registration process. We know this is going to be very challenging. We know there are some people that are not going to be able to meet whatever requirements you are making. So treat this one very carefully because this is a potential barrier 
preventing people from voting once again this re-registration or verification process the time frame to say that i have 50 days to come back to dominica to make sure that i can vote in an election is just ludicrous and it says to me that this report was somewhat out of context i believe that from the time you are born you first of all have to wait 18 years before your name can go on that registration that register of voters only death should take your name from that register brothers and sisters only death we should not have any time limit and i don't see how sir byron his salary must be bigger than a lot of us but how are we going to afford a plane ticket in 90 days to come down to make sure we can vote it's like you're not taking the socio-economic reality of dominica into context and you're proposing these things 50 days 90 days come on that's a barrier that time frame is a barrier to prevent you from voting brothers and sisters and lastly lastly i will say on the issue of access to the media we have to be very careful about equal access to the media because i saw some recommendations saying that the opposition should be given equal time but let's look at tonight you have ronald charles trying to insinuate that the driver's license and, and, the, and the passport is like you cannot use it you know in, in, the, in the wrong place at the wrong time he has put he has misdirecting us insinuating that the voter's ID is required. That you say when you go to a police, a police is going to ask you for your driver's license. But I made the point, as we say, you can travel to an front airport with your driver's license, your social security, or your passport. So he's just trying to misdirect us. Okay? Same like Mrs. Shillingford. So when you give people access to your state media, especially during an election, and they go in there saying what they want, misleading the public, I do not support that. The state media is a very reputable form of information dissemination and I think it should, be, it should be for only government officials who have the responsibility to disseminate accurate information not just what they believe. Thank you very much Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much for that contribution. Mr. Boston, Sherman Boston. He's right there standing. Good evening. Hello, good evening, good evening. Yeah, good evening, everyone. My name is Am Sherman Boston from Stock Farm. Can we turn up the mic, please? Go ahead, it's on. It's just Hello. not. Yes, Hello. go ahead. All right, yeah. good evening again, everybody. Uh, my name is Sherman Boston. First of all, I would, kind, I would like to say that I kind of disappointed from my. This is my second time at this consultation and it turned into a political campaign. And that is very, very disappointing. Because we have to ask ourselves, what is it that we're trying to accomplish here? The, the government has bring forth a reform or modernization, whichever word you want to use. The opposition has been crying for it for a long while. But what exactly it is we want to accomplish as a country in this consultation? Because I don't think it should be a reform that will sway towards labor, towards United Workers Party towards freedom, but it should be swayed towards the Dominican people and giving the people what they want. So I don't think that we should come here and just try to bash each other by giving when they give their opinion based on what they believe and what you believe. Because plenty of us think that we say we're correct and we say what we say is, is very wrong. But anyway, I won't dwell too much on that because actually tonight they are fought as they had invited members of the local government of authorities around Dominica. Well, some pastors Dominica that they be offered, they be offered the opportunity to speak, because as they are part of the election process. So I came in here. I was there the first time when the candidates of the last election was there. But as I said again, it had turned into a political discussion, bashing left and right. So I decided not to speak. But I came today to speak, and I was kind of a discouraged, almost ready to leave. Then I heard my name called by Miss Privo. So then I decided I stay and speak. Now, certain things we're looking at in this Mr. Byron report, and I like to say, like, if you read through it, and you take your time and read through it, Mr. Byron's giving some very good recommendations, but he's outlining other person recommendations, and I think that some of us are taking what he outlined as other person recommendation as his recommendation, because he outlines certain recommendations by the ex-political -polit leader. He recommends some recommendations by the government, and other stakeholders. But some of us only read it 
it seems that we're reading it like everything he, that is in the report is from Sylvain and Byron, and I, I think that is wrong. Now, in, in, in the terms of regist registration, I think what we need to talk about, persons that are eligible to be registered, people that are registered already are registered already, but people that are eligible to be registered, because I don't think it is fear that right now we are in Dominica living, and the United Kingdom have put restriction on us to come to the United Kingdom. But at present, our law, at present, our law states that if somebody from the United Kingdom come to Dominica, they come here and they stay here for a period of one year, they are eligible to be registered and to vote. We're talking about all kinds of things about our cousin in studying and our auntie. You know, our legislation is saying that someone from Africa, once they're from a Commonwealth country, can come here, stay here for you, and they can vote. And we're talking about decent pricing, but we don't have a franchise. You don't have nothing. And still, I even say that in the report, you know, the predominant feature that making somebody eligible to vote in Dominica is not being a born Dominican. And we're fighting over all that kind of a thing. We're not seeing that our le legislation, which is the colonial legislation, we're going forward with. We have to try to take out the colonial rule from that because that legislation was designed to make people from England come to Dominica and they can choose who that have to run Dominica. And we're trying to take that forward and we are hostile about workers and labor and not seeing a big picture of what we can accomplish now. I think that is saddening, that is disheartening and that is just wrong. But anyway, as I said in my beginning, everybody tells their opinion, so it is not a problem. I just want to say too long now because honestly, I don't get too emotional. Now, on on the the proposal by Mr. Byron of the increase of persons coming to Dominica, they can stay 90 or 50 days. Someone even recommended they should change from five years to 10 years. I want to ask a question. Presently, it is once you come to Dominica, I warn you. How is that information being stored? How is it that somebody know that that person was in Dominica for one year and he can vote? So even at present, what we have, it not, there's not a working system to even ensure that the person, what we have now, are actually eligible to vote. But we are making noise about trying to make our political party have strength. At the end of the day, when you look at it, if we push forward that colonial law, all we're doing when you see we choose politics is choosing who's going to hold the whip over our back. It is workers, it is labor. But we, we need to look to liberate ourselves as a people. And we cannot do it when we have this kind of a laws in place. I will hold the, 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 the firm fact that what we need in Dominica is a total legislative revamp. Because that thing there has too much loopholes for wickedness. And that is what that causing confusion. And to the government, in the interest of peace and unity, certain things, especially in cleaning the list of dead people, if there is such a thing, because people are saying, my family, he died how long? And he's on the list. I don't know. I have a brother that passed away. My mother went to the electoral office. His name is not on the list. But we can sell that amnesty to the people to bring in the death certificate to make it legal. Because you can't just say, he died, take him on the list. But they have to have some proof. So we can have an amnesty. And then going forward, as Mr. Irish rightfully advised that there is a organization from registry to electoral office. I know rubbish man, you see, all you come there for the cheerleaders and all you tell us we're going to have a nice form of discussion, but we bring in our cheerleaders here every time. If you watch that thing, and it's embarrassing, you know, because we have um, observers here, and I show to them it is it's embarrassing when we bring people here to just shook our pom-pom, because it's supposed to be a neutral discussion. Okay, no matter which party you support, and don't matter the color because somebody say something to change the law for neutrality, for it to look and press them down. Because at the day when it change, it's for all of us. If it remains the same, it's for all of us. But we're looking at it like it's a political thing. But if we don't defend democracy, all the freest things you see we're looking for will just become our jail cell. Because I can guarantee you, in the in the absence of democracy, the only place you get in freest things is in prison. I have much more to say, you know, but maybe at the time I'll come around and where they will have a civil discussion based on what we want to accomplish here. Maybe I'll make another 
observation, but for tonight, and Madam Chair, I'd really like to have a hard copy of to read that thing thoroughly and maybe give a better discussion. Anyway, good night and thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Boston. Um, we let's have Miss Mandisa also, Mandisa, and then Binta Prospect. I'm no, you are not, but they are num I do have a number of names. I'm trying to call as many people as possible. Um, Binta, Mandisa also. I'm still on my second list, by the way. Mandisa also, go ahead. And then Binta Prosper. Okay, good evening. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Honorable Kassani Navil, Acting Prime Minister, members of Cabinet, uh, Chairman Levi Peter, uh, stakeholders, observers. I know some of, well, I know everybody's getting tired. Some of us want to go home. So I'm going to make it as brief as possible. We have a couple of children here that are tired and want to go home. <laughs> so, um, yes, um, I would like to start by stating that I support cleansing of the list. Um, I am a social worker by profession and I worked at the social welfare division for a number of years. And I'm just making the comparison when we had issues of persons who were receiving public assistance for a number of years under that system and they died. They were deceased. And it, always, it was our responsibility as social welfare officers to go into the communities and to go into the village councils and to uh, assist in cleansing of the list and providing periodic reporting to the ministry that um, John Brown or Joseph so-and-so is deceased and is no longer required to continue to receive public assistance. So this is something that is handled by author auth authorizing agencies in the government, and in this case, the electoral uh, office. Um, so um, I think that is something um, that is important. And when we say that um, dead people are voting, that's, is, that's all it means, that uh, somebody who is deceased should not continue to be on the list in the event that somebody can just walk in and vote um, uh, on that, maybe vote in um, Kalibishi. Can I finish, please? Let's, let's allow. Can I finish Manisa my point, continue? please? Thank you. Right. So the purpose of that, I support the cleansing of the list. It's important we have authorizing agencies that can do that, because I'm comparing the welfare division. There were persons who are deceased, and a cousin or a family member was still coming to pick up the money. So it was important to cleanse the list. This is all I'm saying. I support cleansing the list to ensure that persons who are deceased on the list, somebody is not coming in to vote for them. That's all I'm saying. Secondly, <laughs> um, right, so, the government should, en should ensure Let's that there are systems in place in the Electoral Commission to make I sure that to it's hear. done, to ensure Can that there's on, free and fair elections. However... Can you I'm hold on, please? Just one minute. Um, again, we are probably giving Miss, Mrs. Dyer a little bit of a headache. We would like to hear clearly what Mandisa is saying. So if we can... Thank you very so much. I Go am ahead. for the cleansing of the list. But I am also, I see there's a controversy about national ID cards and voter. I, I, I don't understand what that controversy is about. If you are coming in to vote and you have an identifi identification card, whatever that is, call it a national ID card, an identifi identification card, and that identifies you as a person going in to vote, I don't see the controversy in all that. Because at present time, we walk in to vote, we put an X, and we cannot be identified as if, 
I am Mandy Soseni, and then I walk in and I vote under Dorothy Alexander's name. Maybe I can do that because I don't have an ID. So that is the... Can I finish? Right. Can I finish my point? <laughs> Can Mandisa complete her point, right. please? I realize it's late and some of us are... Can I finish my point? Okay. Let's allow, let's allow the young lady on the floor to complete her point. I don't want to be oh. a teacher and start putting people outside today. And I don't have... So I am in um, support of an ID card, whether it is a driver's license, whether it's a social security, as long as it's a card that, that can identify you. I think what we need to be concerned about, I think what we need to be concerned about is if we're bringing in new systems in place, that, that can be a burden and added cost to the government when we can use existing resources. That is what we need to be concerned about. If we bring in a voter's ID card, what systems are in place to be able to monitor that new system? When a card gets lost, what is the printing um, procedures in place? Do, do the citizens have to pay for that replacement? So the cost effectiveness of a system like a voter's ID card needs to be considered in this reform process. <clears throat> I am also um, for anybody that is a Dominican citizen to be able to vote. It doesn't matter where in the diaspora that you are. Diasporans, persons in the diaspora are not necessarily persons in the UK, Canada, or the US. We have diasporans next door. We have diasporans in Antigua. We have diasporans in St. Lucia, Guadeloupe, right next door, who probably run businesses in Dominica and come to Dominica three, four, five times in a year. They, they pay taxes here. They own homes here. They support their families here. So I am in support of diasporans voting. I don't think we should infringe on the rights of individuals who are already registered. If you are registered, you should remain on the list. That's my opinion. I don't understand what all this is about. Persons on the list should re-register. This is a system that requires monitoring, government resources, officers. I don't see the point in that. Um, I don't like to piggyback on politics in the UK and America. I, 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 heard a lot, I hear a lot of, um, you know, uh, persons talking about piggybacking on how things are done in the United States. So I am not really for piggybacking on, on how things are done in the US to be done here. But if we're looking to modern, modernize the electoral reform, the electoral process, we can consider um, fingerprinting, um, persons maybe being able to vote when they're not in the country, like this lady said. Um, I understand that Americans, they can be anywhere in the world, they can go to a nearby embassy, they can vote. Because we really don't want to interfere with the dem democratic rights of citizens who are voting in Dominica. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Melissa. Um, let's have been to Prosper. I know that a number of people are putting up their hands, but keep in mind we had a number of individuals who put up their hands very early on, so we have a, a long list. Let's try to see as many as possible. Binta Prosper, is there Binta Prosper who had a hand up earlier? Okay, if not, then we have Mr. Ken Thomas. Mr. Ken Thomas. Hold on, Ken Thomas. He had his hand up very early. Go ahead. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. I just want to. Good evening. Go ahead. I want to um, give due credence to the acting prime minister and the cabinet and everybody that's present, including the monitors. So. 
I have just around two points to make. First of all, I'm a born Dominican. And um, a few years ago, I migrated to Canada. I lived there for a couple of years. Now I come back, I come back here, and now I'm being told, I come back here, build my house, open a business. Now I'm being told that if I go back, I have to spend up to 50 days or 90 days in order to remain on a lease. This is pure nonsense. Whoever come up with that idea, I t just trash that. That idea about removing people from the list, just trash that. That makes absolutely no sense. Okay? Every Dominican have a fundamental right to vote. That is one of the most important things you can do for your country, is to vote. That is almost comparable to being free to, to, um, to go to church wherever you want. So I don't see no reason why somebody should tell me I'm a born Dominican and I cannot vote because I am living in Guyana or Canada or the US. This is pure nonsense, okay? So whoever come up with that idea, just trash that, foolishness. Second point. Second point. Second point is, my lady, God loves you, and I love you too. So don't be so angry. Anger kills. My second point is, a lot of people use the term patriotic very loosely. What is the, what is the meaning of patriotic? Oxford Diction the Oxford Dictionary says that patriotic is having an expression have you know expressing devotion to and and strong support for one's country this is what patriotic is all about so trying to take away my vote you're trying to be very unpatriotic by trying to take away my vote as a citizen you guys need to stop that foolishness okay so so that thing about cleansing the list by trying to take our diaspora out of the list is nonsense. The only cleansing the list needs is to remove the dead persons of the list, and that's a very simple matter that has been discussed. We don't even have to um, we don't even have to talk about that. That's very simple to do. Treasury um registry with with the um commission. That is the only link we need. Every every death is is record. Is recorded as long as it's recorded send it send it up there and they take it out simple as that all right so I just want to applaud the the whole report I mean it's not everything that everyone will agree with me personally I would not be I would I would I wouldn't be telling you the truth if I tell you I, I agree with everything the report says. But it's a report. It is a report for us to, 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 to a draft or whatever you want to call it. For us to ponder on it and, and, and look at it and see what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. And come up with a consensus that, that makes sense moving forward with that reform. That is what it is. Okay? So certain things don't make absolutely no sense. You cannot take up people off, off the list because we are all Dominicans. We need to vote. So I just want to say that um, I thank everyone here. I mean, we have different opinions, but we don't have to be rude to each other. You don't know me, I don't know you. You don't have to tell me go back. I have, I have, you know, so, thank you. I mean, that's just thank how it you. is. Thank so you. thank you very much. And um, my name must stay on the list because in a few years, I think I might be moving back again for a couple of years and I will come back and vote again. So you guys can never stop me from voting. I must come back and vote. Thank you. We are, okay, so Binta Prosper is still here. Good evening, everyone. Take your time. My name is Binta Prosper, and everybody know me as Callers. I am from the Mao constituency, voting Kenfield. I am an NEP worker and a very proud Dominican, I must say. Good night, liberals observers, dignitaries, acting prime minister, everybody. We are here, we say about electoral reform. What is electoral reform? The people who are asking for electoral reform are not here. Where are they? Okay. 
electoral reform is not just about Byron says, PM says, Kasani says. It is a debate, a consultation for all and everyone in the country, whether you like it or not. That is the reason I am here. I am not here for labor. I am not here for workers. I am here for my rights as a Dominican. You know what? We usually say, hey, we are Dominican. Isn't Dominican independent country? Why should we have to look for people to help us? And we have diasporas that aid in, and then we say we do not want them to vote. If you don't like the Americans, don't like the biscuits. Okay? On, on the point of ID, on the point of ID. Hold on, Bintia. Everybody in Dominic. Sorry, just one minute. I'm not, I'm not cutting okay. you off. There's a vehicle, hold on, PN320. Um, can you please move your vehicle? You are blocking someone who really needs to move right now. PN320, if you are in here, please move your vehicle. Go ahead, um, Binta. I can continue? Uh, go ahead, yes. Can I continue? Now, if you don't like the Americans, don't like the biscuit. On the point of ID, if I have a driver license, a passport, a social security, anything that has my face, my name, isn't that my identity? Am I a female or a male? Doesn't, doesn't it say that on the, on the cards or on the, the, the whatever you want to put? That makes no sense, okay? And to tell me, I am a Dominican. My sister is living in Martinique. Every three months or every month, she comes down takes good from Dominica, bring it back to Martinique, to and fro. She's not contributing. So what is contribution? Sitting down and blah, 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 blah. Don't do no work and then you say electoral reform? No. People do your work. I don't have any degrees like you all, and I am not here to say chapter, constitution, and whatever bullshit you're talking about. Okay? I am here to make my point. Yes, because to me, most of the people are playing educated. I work on the road. I'm a sanitary engineer. But all you have, all the degrees. All the degrees. Yes. You are, yes. Yes. degrees or you have all the credentials and yet you block your minds to one set of nonsense in this country everything we say this one that one nobody says us i am at fault as well if i don't have the country to move how is it going to move this is the right of a dominican this is the right of a patriotic citizen you cannot tell me to vote well you tell me don't vote Paul Rep, Acting Prime Minister PM, get your task force as I'm coming. I am coming. You're not holding me back. Okay? I think everybody, whether crippled, retarded, reading, writing, none, have a right to express their views. Whether I like it or not, but I am a Dominican. I have a right to voice my views. Okay? I am very happy for that consultation. Whether you are for it or you are against it. At the end of the day, we are Dominicans. Who like it or not, live. And I want again, do not try to take away anybody's rights to vote. You all will cause war, war, war in that country. Everybody that, are, that is here today knows everybody, each and every one of us, is looking for the welfare for all of us family. So if you don't look beyond your nose, don't vex me if I'm doing it. Help to do your work. With that being said, everybody, good night, bless, and think of your future, your children, and your country. Bye-bye.
Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you very much, um, Binta, for that very passionate contribution. Um, I'm going to call. I'm going to call four speakers next and then we'll do we'll take another round of speakers so we have mr ian williams mr felix thomas mr michael timothy and miss sonia charles so these four speakers in that in that order and yes i am seeing hands but there are a lot of people so i am going through um ian williams if he's still here he was very early his hands right he had his hands up very early uh, Mr. Felix Thomas, Michael Timothy, and Sonia Charles. Yes, go, good night, good night, good night. Um, I must say, I must say, democracy. Speak up, the technicians, our mic. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I must say tonight, democracy is definitely a lie. And anyone who says that it is not, they have to think again. Because what we are witnessing here, although it may be a little disorderly, but democracy is what it is. And we have to keep this whole process alive. This whole process. Now, let us bear in mind that we are now in the process of shaping a very important part of our future. It's our destiny. This is not a joke. This is not a joke. And I would like to say kudos to the government. Because in my lifetime, I have never seen any, any participation and democracy alive like that. I have never seen any consultation to that level. So I'd like to say kudos to the government for making sure that we all participate as Dominicans in shaping that part of our future. Now, I, I, I have listened to a lot of the consultative uh, meetings and so, and I will make my presentation very short. I am one that do not believe that if the state give us that right that we have to wait 18 years to exercise. That anyone, anyone should be given the right to take it away. So no matter where you are, no matter how long you have been away for, you are Dominican. We have to bear in mind too that sometimes we work overseas. Persons live through um, you, you, you know, whatever circumstance. And then we, we, we think that unless they send a barrel, we, put, we, we, we tend to put a value to that vote. And I, I, I don't think we should. If it is our democratic right, let it, re, let it remain that way. Because if, if you're working, for example, in Canada for 10 years, 10 years you're working, and let's say you're in a, a a big position and, and, and you're, you're, you're being a role model to others. That to me has more value than a barrel because the younger ones can look up and say, you know, my dad made it. He have hope. There's hope. It gives us hope that we can make it to that level. So let, let us not put a dollar value or a barrel value on, on our democratic right. Let no one take away that right. I think two, two reasons why your name, I think your name should be able to rem be removed from the list. One, if you are dead. And two, if you choose, let it be your cho choice. I, the honor should be on the voter to decide whether or not his or her name should remain on the voter's list. Let it be your choice. So you cannot come back and say three years, two, two, two elections, that, oh, um, say, scary, kifesa. 
and, uh, and let us not joke about it, it will be said, you know. It will be said. So let us put the owners on the voter. Let him decide or let her decide that she or he do not want to participate in the general election. And I, I, I should take it further to say that I think that request should be notarized. And it should not just be a note to the registrar saying that I am no longer interested in participating in the election. I think it should be notarized. So you cannot say, next election, oh, my party, my party, my party has a little hope. I want to be re-registered. We have to be serious about those things. We have to bear in mind also that the electoral office is a non-revenue earner to the country. And we have to be careful the burdens that we place on that department of government. We cry, we do not want to pay any taxes. But where, where do we expect, where do we expect the millions of dollars, the millions of dollars, for example, to pay for campaign funds to come from? Where is it going to come from? When we, when we add another card that we have to use only in five years, once every five years, I for sure will not find that card. <laughs> I can tell you. I, I, I cannot hold a card to, to, to use once, uh, once every five years. So we, we have to be careful how we look at those things and not add any additional burden to our treasuries. All right? So I, for one, the issue about campaign financing should be a no-no. All parties, you man enough, find your campaign funds. Find your campaign funds and not rely on, hey, if you do a government, I think I will form another po political party. Because if there is a million dollars for campaign, I, 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 surely I can get five people to, to campaign and try to get that, that million dollars. All right, so I think everybody, all parties should find their own way out. That, that also gives us, that also tells us who, who is who. Because as somebody rightly said, if you, cannot, if you cannot get people to gravitate to you, gravitate to you, and maybe assist in giving you some campaign funds, why should I, or what would give me the hope, or tell me that you are capable? What should tell me that you are capable if you cannot even raise campaign funds? So we should see it as a, a, as a way to test the political parties. Let us test them. Let us see whether you have negotiation skills. All right, so I am not for that campaign funds. Um, on the issue of um, cleansing the list, I was part. I was part of a very integral part of the in elections last elections. And if all parties, if all parties, and I may dare say so, if all parties do the work that the Labour Party did in the last election, that list will be cleansed in next to no time. In next to no time. So I think political parties have to do their work and not sit back and complain and it should not be when an election is called you put your machinery in place and you blame the whole system because you are not ready if you have a political party you should have it going let the machinery go on and on and not sit back and wait for general elections for you to start your start the process going all right? So, like, like I said, I am for the, the voter, the national ID card. I think it, it is more, um, yeah, it, it can be utilized a lot more than just a voter identification card. Because I, I do not see, or no one has convinced me that this is going to make any difference in the general election. It's not going to make any difference whether you have a national ID card, a voter ID card. Those cards are not going to make any difference to the general election. 
There, when, when you go to vote, when you go to vote, there are party representatives, which are persons from the constituency. So how is it that you are telling me that John Brown can take the identification card, the, 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 the name of Dick, and come in to vote for Dick? That doesn't make no sense. Because the persons at the persons at the um, at the polling station, they know everybody. All right, so that that doesn't make no sense. That doesn't make sense. The whole idea is that we, I am so in support of some identification to identify the person who is coming in to vote, whether it's your passport, whether it's your driver's license, your social security card. The young people, I, 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 a young lady made a very important um, point that they do not, at 18, sometimes it's difficult for them to get social security card. So there, yeah, I, I, I need, uh, you need to know who is who at that point. So I, I am all for that. Um, just, just one more point. Uh, no, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Williams, uh, Mr. Felix Thomas, and then Mr. Michael Timothy. Get a mic to him, please. Testing one, two, one. Let me say a very pleasant good night to each and every one of you. Let me recognize the head table and everyone who have contributed thus far to this consultation. Madam Chair, when you open the session, you called on us to repeat the Lord's Prayer, didn't you? So I'm taking it for granted that we respect the supremacy of God, quote unquote. So we believe in God. We know his name. Let me say, Madam Chair, that this exercise is a very worthwhile one. It is the first of its kind and it's different in nature from all, all other kinds of political discussions because elect electoral reform is in fact and indeed a political exercise. And we cannot divorce the politics from it. And that is quite evident because we see people coming here, including myself, will represent the views of the party that I support. And we cannot be hypocritical about that. And that is all well and fair. All we ask for is that it must be in, in order and in decency. I envy, Madam Chair, your courage, your skill, and the, you know, the manner in which you have conducted those sessions so far. And I think you deserve a great hand of applause for that. I listened over the past few weeks to every consultation and to everyone who gave their views. Of concern, Madam Speaker, Madam Chairman, you see it's so parliamentary, that's why I said it's political. Of concern, Madam um, Chairman, is the bringing out of, an, of ideas that represent a political party is not an issue, but you also invited persons of the legal profession, and I expected them to speak in that category as a legal person, showing the pros and cons or the legality of whatever changes that are to be done in, the, in our electoral process. And I expect the legal persons to be honest about that. So too, Madam Chair, people representing the church, people representing, quote-unquote, the God-based people. And I expected from some of them to hear a free and balanced contribution. Sad but true, I did not get that as well. So that con gives the conclusion that it is a political divide. Let me say, Madam Chair, that, you know, God is the supreme ruler of the world and he has his desire is that 
all countries be governed orderly and justly. And Dominica is no exception. He is the source of all authority and he has given to governments as his representatives on earth the authority to administer society. So that is government responsibility. I just want to make it short. But we see a different nature of government. While it has the authority, it has the authority to govern society. We see this Labour Party administration involving the people in whatever decisions it wants to make. You don't see that in the United States. You don't see that in England. You don't even see that in our other CARICOM countries. But we are able to get together. We are able to get together and discuss that issue. Let me say that the basic economic function of government is not to control but to promote, encourage economic stability and growth. Note again that they are not to control or dictate how and why when but instead ensure that what is positive is advanced. A lot of the suggestions that are being made are those positive suggestions. The answer to that is no. And of course, there must be dissenting voices, dissenting voices to ensure that these negatives are addressed and ensured that they do not become part of our legislation when it comes to electoral reform. What I have heard from persons representing the church seems like a lack of understanding or a blatant disregard for what God desires of government and his role, its purpose, therefore. If God has ordained government with the civil responsibility and they in turn involve the people I expect the people who are representing God or God's church or God's people as representative of, the, of, of God look at the will of that God and contribute seriously. But we didn't get that coming. So here we are discussing main issues. An issue like the right to vote. That is a God-given right. That is a God-given right because God has chosen a government and the governments have given the people that right. Why then should somebody want to take that away from them? Why then should you want to make voting more difficult instead of making it easier for the people? Let us understand clearly, the only way we can move forward is to be truthful to ourselves. This could have gone away uh, uh, around another way, in a different style. Every political party, for example, the Labour Party could go and have consultation among its people. Then you would hear the cry, it was one-sided. But there you are bringing persons of all, of all political divides together, to reason together. And what we saw happening, what we see we, actually hold happening, on, hold on, is, that, hold on. is that the views... Um, hold on. Can we... Um, I would like to advise those who are leaving. If you can use the door to the side, you will get something on your way out. But let's not crowd up the back and cause more disorder. Okay, and we really should not be sharing food at this time. Can we... Okay, can we have some order, please? Mr. Thomas is, is on the floor. If you are leaving,
Yes, can you go ahead, please, and let's try to hear yeah, the number of people who would like to speak. We would need to we need to wrap up. We've been here for three and a half hours, Madam Chair, and we have a number of other Madam speakers. Chair, so let's just try yeah. to be as brief Real, as possible. Realizing the constraint on you and the great job that you have done, I think I just wish, wish to call it so short and compliment you again. Compliment the AG for the manner in which he has brought out that review, and let me. Just compliment all those who participated. But let me even do that more so to those who were positive in their contribution. Our views, our contributions are not constitutional. But what we must recognize is the government's willingness to have an input from the nation, from the people who will form government. And I believe that is a good exercise and we should not abuse it, but take good advantage of it. I want to thank you. Thank you very much. Let's have Mr. Michael Timothy, and then Ms. Sonia Charles. Um, the mic, there's a mic behind you. Um, good evening to everyone, the panelists, the um, protocol established, as established. I'm here tonight to speak as a Dominican, I do not see no party color. I want to give my honest truth, so I'd like somebody and my opinion, so I'd like the people to respect hearing me because I came here from around 7.15 to now. I have never disturbed no one in their deliberation. Okay? I, Michael H. T. Murphy, stands for voter ID. And I'll tell you why I want voter ID. Tonight there, there were two Ronald Charles, right? I know more than one Felix Thomas, right? I, I, I want to get a voter ID so that I can clone them to their polling area so that as a result, Felix, Ronald Charles will not go and vote in Newton and the other Ronald will not go to, to thing, okay? Can I hear myself, please? Can I hear myself, please? I give everybody an opportunity to speak. Can I hear myself? Um, Mr. Mr. Timothy, I will I will cheer. I was an so agent in I was an agent in a polling station in 2019. And you know the modus operandi was come and say your name. I live in Kenfield after the Grenada War in 1983 to 2023. That is 40 years. And I, I raised with people that came back to vote in the 2019 election. And first time. I saw these people because I'm a person I move around. I move around. As a result, you see, you see, you see the disrespect? We come to a consultation to, for ideas to content, for ideas to roll, but just because I have an opposing view, which is a positive view for voter ID. We have voting cards for different things. We have driver's license for driving. We have we have passport for traveling. Okay? So I am for voter ID, and I'm for the cleansing of the list, clean the list, take out the dead people on the list, I'm for voter registration. And tonight, dear Mr. Jaisaia Binwa, you were extremely dishonest in your point that Ms. Schillingford made that CBI citizens have an equal right to vote, just as other Dominicans, recognized by Sir Dennis Byron in page 28 of the report. Okay, Mr. Jen Jaisaia Binwa, very soon, there will be more CBI citizens than born Dominicans. This is, this, this is honestly what we wanted for us as children of Dominica. You know in the United States, you must be a born American to be a president. And you must be 45 years to be a president. I want in this legislation. Can we I stop have to the, talk hold on, Mr. Timothy? Respect my, everybody. Can we? Everybody. You, I, I want to see in this legislation that no Can foreign... we allow the person on the floor to speak? Please, can we have some order? Let's try to wrap up. I realize people, our patience is wearing very thin. So we are going to wrap up. Just try to close up, Mr. Timothy. Electoral reform or modernization that no foreign CBI Dominican can be the president or the prime minister of Dominica. Please put in legislation. I, as a Dominican, all my life, I would not want to see somebody from any foreign land come 
and rule me in my birthright country. So, Mr. Mr. H. E. put a clause where we will only have born Dominicans as prime minister and the president, any other ministry they can have. Put that in the clause of the remodernization. Okay, I want, I have my findings. Two term limit for the prime minister, cleansing of the voters list, cap election spending. Okay? I want any Dominican diaspora that wants the right to vote has to be paying taxes. A government is run by taxes. Any diaspora who wants to vote must pay taxes locally to Dominica in the Inland Revenue or Treasury. Okay, good night. And I want to see a cap on financing of an election. Also, the schools, hospitals, everywhere need supplies. Too much big money in government, too much big money in elections in Dominica. And that must stop. Cap elections. Good night. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Timothy. Um, can we have... Can we have... We are going to stop after the last speaker. We will have one more speaker. I am, I, you all are wearing me out. I'm very serious now. Can we have Sonia Charles, please? Can we have Sonia Charles, please? Is Sonia Charles there? Can we give her the mic? Sonia Charles. Um, if not, then um, we have Mr. Cyril Pelte and Vado, who wanted to speak. We'll take these two. Or else we are stopping at this point in time if we cannot have any order. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am actually going to wrap up at this point in time. I do appreciate all of the feedback. I mean, can you at least allow me to speak? Thank you very much. Okay. Um, we are going to wrap up. We've been here for about three, three and a half hours. A number of people have left. A number of our listeners have left. There are about 50 more people who would like to speak. It's not physically or practically possible for everybody to speak at this time. Um, the AG is going to wrap up on a few points and then we are going to close up. Thank you. Um, just, just two points, really. One, one is the issue of taxes that was just been suggested, that taxes should be a, a requirement for somebody to vote. But in the, in, the, in the contribution, the suggestion was anybody who's overseas and wants to vote should have to pay taxes. But you'd, you, if you have to do that, you'd have to make, make it that taxes would also have to, in other words, for a local person to have to vote, they would also have to be somebody paying taxes. So that, that is not a practical solution, quite apart from the fact of whether or not it may, may or may not be constitutional. So I think that that's something that we need to, need, we need to bear in mind. The other issue is the, the, the um, reference to economic citizens. That's been made quite a few times. The law and the constitution is that nobody can, can be registered to vote far less to vote unless they have been resident in a constituency for at least three months. So any economic citizen or indeed any Dominican, even if a person has been living here and they're 18 years of age, 20 years of age, 30 years of age, and they have not lived in the constituency for which they are seeking to be registered, they cannot be registered. So the issue of, of what I'm hearing about economic citizens, as far as I can see, is a red herring. It's not something that's realistic. The other thing is that we have to bear in mind that the Constitution is what governs us. A lot of the discussion is not based on the Constitution. So we cannot change and divide the, qual the types of citizens we have. Every citizen, according to the Constitution, has the same right, but they also have to follow the same rules. So if you're a citizen and you have not lived in the constituency, you can't vote. Thank you.